Good evening and welcome to the October 9th, 2018 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Uh, would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Doreen, could you please call the roll? Corey Fellows. Here. Roger Bealey. Here. Nicholas McGee. Here. Richard DuPerry. Here. Rachel Henriksen. Here. Robin Saunders. <laughs> Joel Simons. Here. Great, thank you. So a couple of quick notes. Uh, first off, welcome to Joel. Just joined the board. Thank you. Forward to serving with you. And uh, in the absence of Ms. Saunders, uh, Mr. DuPerry, who is our first alternate, will be a voting member this evening. So. Please note that for the record. Um, next item, approval of minutes from the August 27th, 2018 and September 17th, 2018 meetings. I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. All right. Second. We have a second. Any discussion of that? It was absolutely the 27th, so we'll be putting in the September 17th minutes on. Okay. Uh, it makes sense to do separate votes. I also was absent for that August 27th meeting, so I will abstain from that as well. Uh, That's the one I conducted, right? I was the chair, yeah. and everything was fine. <laughs> <laughs> right, nothing to discuss. All right, so um, <clears throat> vote first on the August 27th minutes. All in favor? All right. That's unanimous, with the exception of those abstaining and the September 17th minutes. All in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Uh, a couple more quick housekeeping notes before we move into the uh, action items. First, um, item number 13, Mill Commons Development, LLC, um, which is the second of the two agenda items this evening related to the crossroads, proposed crossroads development has been tabled at the request of the applicant. Um, secondly, again, even with that, item being tabled, we are continuing our trend of having a very full, long agenda. Um, and we've regret regrettably had to table a couple of uh, applicants in the last couple of meetings because we've run out of time. The board has a policy of not starting any new items after 1030. So with that in mind, um, we're going to try to get through this as efficiently and quickly as possible while still being thorough. I just ask that applicants and applicant teams just try to be succinct in your presentations assume that we've read your materials as well as the staff comments related to those and I would make a similar request to board members to try to be as concise as possible um, but I certainly don't want to dissuade anyone from from speaking up okay so moving right along Item number five, the planning board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to chapter 405, the zoning ordinance, to amend the boundary of the crossroads plan development zoning district. Jamel? Sure, just a quick, uh, sure, just a quick background, as I'm sure the applicant will provide even more background than me. Um, but as the agenda notes, the uh, folks are here tonight for a proposed amendment to the zoning to the, amend the boundary of the Crossroads Plan Development Zoning District on our town zoning map. Um, the council has held their first reading of the proposed map change, uh, and they still need to hold their second reading and public hearing uh, following the board's review tonight. And that's what I have. Thank you, and I'll hand it over to Mr. Bacon. Uh, thank you very much. Dan Bacon of Girl Palmer. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Jamel. And I'll uh, be quick um, per your, per your uh, request. And I think this is a pretty quick and easy request um, by Crossroad Holdings LLC. Um, I think as the, the board well knows, the Crossroad <coughs> Zoning District uh, applies only to Scarborough Downs. Um, and this is a zoning map amendment to actually include a portion of property that was originally zoned in the Crossroads, but when the property was acquired by uh, Crossroads Holdings, it was identified as actually not being owned by uh, the Downs property. Um, so in April, uh, we worked with the planning board and the council and, and updated the overall boundary of the district to follow the accurate and current property boundaries. 
uh, which resulted in, in the map that you see, and it actually resulted in taking this 15-acre parcel out. Um, now Crossroad Holdings is acquiring the parcel to include it as part of uh, the Innovation District, the area of the property that we're working with the Planning Board on currently for a master plan. And so the request mm -hmm. is to include this 15-acre piece back into the Crossroads District so it can be zoned and planned and used um, in unison with, with the rest of the property. So uh, that's, that's the background and, and the reason for the requested zoning map change. Great. Thank you. Um, before we turn into any board discussion, uh, there is the opportunity for public comment here. So if anyone is interested, come on up and introduce yourself. All right, seeing none, I'll turn to the board. I'll just briefly note that some of us uh, did take part in a uh, planning board public workshop uh, last week, uh, which was related somewhat to this item. So I think it, it's, it's familiar to, to some of us, who, those of us who were there. So um, does anyone have any questions or comments on this? No? Can I take that as an indication that folks are generally supportive of this? All right. Everyone's nodding. So uh, I think we are uh, giving a, a positive opinion on that, and uh, we don't have any public comments, so I think that covers it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Item number six, Ready Tubing LLC requests a site plan amendment review for 350 Pine Point Road, Assessor's Map R88, Lot 8. Janelle? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project is located in the TBC4 uh, zoning district at 350 Pine Point Road. Uh, the proposal is before the board tonight for a site plan amendment to install a black steel fence measuring 100 feet in length and 8 feet tall along the front of the existing building on the property. Uh, the applicant has provided several site renderings that depict, depict the location of the proposed fence along with some enhanced landscaping. Uh, so staff would also like to confirm whether the enhanced landscaping as depicted on the rendering is part of this project. That's what I have right now. Thanks, Jamal. Mm -hmm. And I'll turn it over to the applicant. Thanks. Great. Thank you, guys. John Reddy here from Reddy Tubing. Um, the site we're presenting here is at 350 Pine Point Road. And yes, the 100-foot steel fence, the purpose of it is to follow uh, federal re regulations for our lobster shipping and exporting. Um, part of this program, what we're trying to do is really add more value to the site at the same time, because not just on a federal level, but obviously this has municipal um, permitting requirements as well. So when we went about this project, we were trying to think of how we could, well, we could add more value to the site by not just plopping a black fence um, on the site. Initially, before we started, we, um, we were trying to go with the same type of material as a building, which was a more of a stockade style in gray. And after doing a 3D rendering, it didn't look very nice at all. So that's what kind of made us move to the Blacks, more transparent fence that we believe created more transparency for the community and more value, more of a high-end look. Um, as you can see, too, we sprinkled the lot um, with quite a bit of uh, regosas, which we believe adds some um, good color, um, but also really blends in um, the fence uh, in the surroundings, as well as some of those trees that have been planted in front of the property. Um, in the current state. As I said, the desire for us is, is uh, beyond just asking for a fence, is to do the right thing as a tenant or a, a landowner in this community and add more value to this site um, while abiding by the regulations that are put forth. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, we also have the opportunity for public comment on this item, if there's anyone. All right, I don't see anyone on that either. Um, any board members have any comments or questions on this? No? Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward, and um, appreciate the explanation and additional context, and I, I think it'll be a, I think that will be an improvement to that site for sure. Um, and um, this item was one that was tabled from last time, so thank you for your understanding and patience. Um, with that, I would uh, like to put forward an approval motion. I move to approve the site plan amendment titled Fence Project proposed by Ready Tubing LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Ready Tubing LLC dated 
August 22nd, 2018. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. And good luck. <coughs> Item number seven, Hospice of Southern Maine requests a site inventory and analysis and master plan review for 11 Lincoln Avenue, assessor's map R62, lot 29B. Um, before Jamel introduces this one, I'm going to propose that we uh, generally approach this uh, in a way that's, in a manner that's consistent to how we've done this for other similar uh, projects at this stage, and that we'll, um, we'll sort of consider the site inventory piece first, site inventory and analysis piece first, and then master plan. Uh, but with that, I will hand it over to Jamel. Thank you very much. As Corey uh, noted, this project's located uh, in the B3 zone, uh, located sort of kitty cornered behind the Holy Donut, as you can see on the map on the screen. Uh, the applicant was last in front of the board in August for a sketch plan review. Uh, so tonight, uh, the applicants in front of the board for a site inventory and analysis. This review and master plan review are required for projects located in the B3 zone that include five or more acres. And the reasoning they're here with site inventory and master plan tonight is because of a single building project, um, the master plan and site inventory can be submitted at the same time. So just a quick reminder, uh, site inventory and analysis is intended to provide the applicant board and staff with a better understanding of the overall site and opportunities and or constraints that the natural and built environment create for the development of the site. This review tonight does not result in a formal approval or denial of the application. But the, shorter, the board should be sure to determine if the information provides a clear understanding of the site and identifies opportunities and constraints that will guide the utilization. Staff has found that the applicant has generally satisfi satisfied the requirements for site inventory and analysis, but the applicant should discuss uh, the areas that are unsuitable for development with the board tonight and how these will be utilized going forward. So I have. Okay. Thank you. And again, we'll we'll come back to the sort of the master plan piece mm -hmm. of this. And I'll just note as well that with this being a site and a proposal that has previously had um, master plan and uh, site inventory approval, um, I generally anticipate that the first piece of this, the site inventory piece, should be fairly straightforward. But um, we'll tackle that first, and then the master plan gets more into site access and mm -hmm. I think that's where it's going to be a little bit more um, a little bit more substantive I would anticipate so okay with that, right. I'll turn it over to you all right thank you, thank you. I'm Daryl Cady the CEO of Hospice of Southern Maine and we are very pleased to be back here tonight to review the site inventory analysis and master plan and unlike the individual before me we were on the long agenda from the previous meeting and um, so I'm going to turn it over to Andy Johnstone, who is our site engineer, and he's going to cover the material that you just described in greater detail. So thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Andy Johnson, Atlantic Resource Consultants. Uh, I'll try and keep these comments relatively brief as we go through it. Um, I'm sure everybody is by now familiar with the site through the sketch plan um, review process and also through the opportunity to take a site walk, which I know a number of the members of the planning board were able to do. And hopefully that gave them a better feeling for the site and the look of the site and uh, how it relates to the surrounding areas. Um, first off, for those not familiar, this is the, the area of the site we're talking about. As, as Jamal said, the Holy Donut is on the corner. The site extends uh, eastward of the Holy Donut, between the Holy Donut and the Big 20 Bowling, and goes back down towards Lincoln Avenue. Uh, generally speaking, the, the abutting properties around this area are commercial in use. Uh, you have Sullivan Tire, which is almost directly opposite, multi-tenant office building, again, almost opposite, the Big 20 Bowling, um, and a couple of uh, toddling daycare and Welsh sign down on what is the part of the industrial park. Um, I say generally um, what you would expect in the zone, and just to clarify the zone lines on this map, uh, this is in the B3 zone, the whole parcel is within the B3 zone, and you'll see that the B3 zone actually takes a jog around to encompass this parcel and separate it from the industrial 
um, the industrial zone, which is to the south. And the B3 zone, just to refresh anybody who's not familiar with it, is specifically designed to encourage development along the main arterial corridors of Scarborough commercial and, and uh, other suitable development along the commercial corridors, including Route 1. The site inventory, and, and again, many folks on the board will be familiar with this, but I'll go through some of the elements of the site inventory uh, just to let you know and refresh your memory on that. The site parcel is 7.79 acres. Uh, the topography is relatively flat in the front portion of the site. There is a fairly steep gully, an old drainage way that runs down here. This was actually formed by an old Route 1 drainage system that discharged down here and eroded a fairly sharp gully down here. The areas in light green are delineated as freshwater wetlands. There's a small segment of intermittent stream that comes out of that wetland area and drains down towards Lincoln Avenue. The area behind this, this little section of drainage way here is also fairly flat. Uh, and then it drops off down towards Lincoln Avenue. There's a fairly steep gully there. And it's actually fairly, uh, fairly dense and fairly difficult to, to get down through here, as people would have appreciated from the site walk. So this is quite a lot lower than, than the area at Route 1. And the other thing that, that was significant about the site walk, and I hope people got a good feeling for, is, is the lack of visibility from this area of Lincoln Avenue up to Route 1. And in fact, when you see the site plan and the proposed development up here, that would be largely not visible from the entrance on Lincoln Avenue, both due to the topographic change and the vegetation that is in there. The soils are generally silt loams, which are very common in this area. You have uh, Lemoyne, which is actually shares the designation of a Buxton silt loam. There's Scantic silt loams, which follow the drainage way down here, and a, and a little high area of Suffield up on that knoll down behind the Holy Donut. The natural resources I've been through, there's also down in this corner of the site, you'll see there is a shoreland overlay zone. That's why the trees are still intact down there. Some of the site has been relatively recently cleared, but this area was not because it's within the shoreland zone. All the major utilities are in the Route 1 corridor. We have water is on the opposite side of Route 1, sewer also on the opposite side of Route 1 three-phase electric on our side of Route 1, and natural gas on our side of Route 1. There are also uh, sewer and water down in Lincoln Avenue, but they don't get to the frontage of the site. So if you wanted to extend uh, sewer and water from that area, you'd have to extend the main up Lincoln Avenue to meet the frontage of the site. Uh, the only other element that, that is of any interest on this is just that watershed boundary line, which runs diagonally across the bottom corner of the site. And as indicated in one of the staff comments, I think it may have actually been related to the master plan rather than the site inventory analysis. But this area is in the, within the Willowdale Brook watershed. As, as we see as we get a little further along, that is not really anticipated for any development. So going through the inventory and looking at what the opportunities and constraints of the site are, they, they are fairly evident. A uh, little large flat area on Route 1 benefits from good visibility from Route 1, good potential connectivity to Route 1. It's a relatively flat area. There are some, some relic fill areas associated with previous development on the site up in this area, but nothing too substantial. There are also old relic fill areas and a couple of other portions of the site, but again, nothing of great concern. There's a secondary potential development site, this flat area over the other side of the gully. That also presents a, a potential development opportunity, but it certainly doesn't have the visibility and connectivity with Route 1, so it would be very much a secondary um, area of development. So in summary, really, the, the opportunities of the site are presented both by the visibility and the location on Route 1. The zoning is appropriate for what the proposed use is. Um, 
and there is a large enough development area to put the footprint of the site as a secondary development area, potentially to add some more usable space, and there's potential connectivity to Lincoln Avenue and Route 1. The utilities, as I said, are all in place. The potential constraints associated with the site are really just that natural resource wetland feature that runs through the property and forms that drainage way. But again, you know, you, the folks here, maybe not on the board now, will have seen previous development plans for this site. The natural resources do not present a significant constraint to the development of the site. So that's about it for the inventory and analysis, and I'll open it up to questions at this stage. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions about the site inventory and analysis on the board? Uh, again, there's no formal action associated with this particular stage of things, um, but it, is it, I think it's fair to say people are satisfied that the applicants provided sufficient sufficient overview. All right. I'll make a call when you did a good job. So, yeah, that's all I got. Appreciate that. We do appreciate the, the recap and the opportunity for those of us who, who were able to do the sidewalk. Um, Jamel, do you have anything you'd like to add uh, more focused on the master plan? Uh, sure. We can move on to that. All right. We'll move on to that. All right, so the applicant is also in front of the board tonight for a conceptual master plan review. Uh, the master plan is intended to generally lay out how the plan development will be developed, including the proposed use of various parts of the site, a primary road and pedestrian network, overall approach to stormwater management, proposed development areas, proposed open space and buffer areas, and the development standards that will apply to the overall development. The board shall approve the master plan only if, it, only if it finds that it complies with the zoning standards and it is consistent with the site inventory and analysis and reflects a reasonable utilization of the site, given both the environmental and built environment considerations. So as the board may recall, um, during, as discussed during the sketch plan review uh, a month or two ago, the applicant is proposing two full access drives, one from Route 1 and one from Lincoln Avenue. Uh, the site plan review standards uh, state where a site has frontage on two or more streets. Uh, the standards seek to have the planning board require access to the site be provided off the street where there is lesser pot potential for traffic congestion and safety concerns. The applicant has noted that the primary access will be off of Route 1. The town's traffic peer reviewer has suggested that the applicant discuss why an access to Route 1 would be safer and cause less congestion than a primary access on Lincoln Avenue. So the applicant should be sure to discuss this with the board tonight. And another comment, uh, the applicant has proposed that the building entrances shall be oriented to the, towards the street and promote an active street frontage. It appears that the entrance of the building faces the proposed parking lot. In order for the standard to be met, an entrance facing Route 1, including a pedestrian connection to the proposed sidewalk, uh, should be provided. And that's what staff asked at this point. Thank you. And I'll hand it back to the applicant. Thank you. Um, and I will start just by describing briefly what is being proposed on the site. Uh, and there are, there are a couple of nuances which I'll try and emphasize as we go through this because some of the, particularly the peer review traffic comments, I don't think really appreciate some of the complexities of the program that's happening in this building. What is proposed is a 14,500 square foot support services building for Hospice of Southern Maine. This does have one of the core functions of this building will be to house all their permanent administrative staff, but this is by no means just an administrative office building. In addition to the 40 or, or 44 uh, permanent office staff hospice have, they have another 60 traveling staff that come to and from their existing facilities and will come to and from this building. So this is a, much more than just an, an administrative building. It offers a home for all those support staff that will be traveling to and from, as I say, and achieving the other functions of hospice of Southern Maine. It does have an educational component. It has a large community room, uh, which also has, has pretty significant implications for traffic, as well as being one of the core parts of their program. 
and it offers bereavement counselling services, which is something they do currently, but they have to shift it around from different facilities because they don't have the space to do it in one consistent location. And, and that also has a, a pretty significant travelling component of folks that come and go and receive those support services. So I'll get a little more in detail into what those, those kind of numbers do when I get right to the end of this presentation, because I'm going to leave all the access discussion to the end, because I think, as everyone will appreciate, that's kind of a whole discussion of its own. So what I'd like to do is focus on everything else first, and then we'll get right down to that at the end. So the core objectives of Hospice of Southern Maine when they build this new facility is to consolidate a lot of these functions that are happening at different locations and at different times, because they simply don't have the space where they are now. They want to emphasize visibility and connectivity with the community. They see themselves as, as an organization that offers services throughout Southern Maine. They want to be visible. They want to encourage people to come in and see their new facility. They want to make it a welcoming resource for people who are traveling by or, or want information on hospice services and, and are encouraged to come in and ask for that information. And they also want to create an attractive and enjoyable work environment. So those are the core objectives of, of the plan, the development plan for their new facility. I also just want to briefly touch on the, the planning framework. And you'll see as I go through this, there are a couple of discrepancies between sections of the ordinance. So I just want to explain that this is in the B3 zone. The zoning ordinance sits above the site plan review ordinance. So in the event of discrepancies between the two, the, the higher ordinance governs. Uh, the, site, uh, the site plan review ordinance, as, as is said at the, at the very top end of the performance standards, the planning board has the ability to waive any of those performance standards if they think it's in the best interest of the town. You don't have the same ability with the zoning ordinance, which sits above it. So when we get to those discrepancies, it's important to learn how those, how those two ordinances interact. So Following on from the inventory and analysis, you'll see on the master plan, the building is, is placed on the primary development area that was identified on the inventory and analysis plan. This is actually the same plan that you saw at sketch plan. There may be some, some important differences coming along the line, but that is the primary development area. It's the most suitable area to develop. It does offer that visibility from Route 1, easy connectivity to utilities, Ease of access and clarity of access, which is something we went through pretty uh, heavily at the sketch plan review stage, and we'll get into a little bit later on in this. So the access and circulation is generally, we have the entrance on Route 1, we have a secondary entrance on Lincoln Avenue, and the parking lot in between. One thing I would like to mention is we're still working with Hospice of Southern Maine on some of these disparate program elements. We are hopeful that we're going to be able to reduce the parking count. I know that was a comment from the planning board at the sketch plan review. We can't promise what the final number is going to be yet because with, with, it's a fairly delicate balancing act here. We want to satisfy the board and we want to reduce the numbers to the extent that it's practical on the site, but we have to make sure that they can still undertake their core functions in this, on this property without overflowing the parking. There's, there's no alternative place to park on the site. But we are hopeful that when we come back for site plan review, you'll see a pretty significant reduction in that parking number. I say it's just something we're working through the numbers on. The utility connections are all proposed on the Route 1 corridor, sewer, water, and three-phase electric. Natural gas, there may be a supplementary uh, heat requirement for the building, and that would also come from that area. The stormwater plan you can see <coughs> sketched out here. Uh, we've actually developed it a little further than this and had a pre-application meeting with DEP. Generally speaking, we're looking at underdrain filters and bioretention. Uh, the town engineer was, was invited to that pre-application meeting, and I think has a better sense of what the, what the stormwater plan is in a little more detail on the site. And the other element you'll see uh, highlighted here is the solar arrays. Uh, this project is proposing a pretty significant green ele energy element. There will be geothermal wells up in the front portion of the site for heating and cooling. 
and solar arrays in two areas of the site. The way the numbers work out right now is that makes this very nearly a net zero uh, building and development. Just a very brief summary of the, the mitigation of some of the constraints on the site. We've discussed this before. This has been through a development plan before. Some of the environmental considerations a lot with the wetlands, there will be some wetland impact. It won't be significantly different to what was proposed and permitted before. So we don't see that as a major obstacle. And we don't see some of those soil, uh, the, the remnants of buildings as being a major issue on the environmental end either. <clears throat> so moving through that, I'll just go right to the comments. And I know there were two in particular that, uh, that Jamal referenced there. One was uh, related to the creation of an entrance facing Route 1. Um, and this is one of the things where there is somewhat of a discrepancy between what you're trying to do with your performance standards and what you're trying to do with the zoning ordinance. So active street frontage, the best definition <coughs> I've seen of active street frontage is a direct visual engagement between people on the street and people inside the building, on the ground floor of the building. If you look at other, other areas, this is a new urbanism type, type planning goal, right? Push the buildings right close to the street. So you have that interaction between the people in the buildings and the people on the street. If you look at comparable ordinances, there's one in Portland. They will actually not allow you to count it as active street frontage if the building is more than 10 feet from the property line. The reason I, I highlight this as a discrepancy between that and the zoning ordinance, the zoning ordinance requires a 35-foot setback off Route 1 in the B3 zone. It also requires a 15-foot landscape strip between uh, the building and Route 1 with the, with the specific aim, and I'll try and find the language, the speci specific aim of screening the building and the activities of the building from the street. So you can't create an active street frontage if you're 35 feet from the street line and you're required to put a landscape buffer in there that's 15 feet wide that is specifically designed to screen the development from the street. So while we appreciate the comment, we, and we appreciate the general, the, the general idea of trying to create active street frontage, one, we don't think it's possible here because of the, because of the zoning regulations, and two, it, it's just not practical. The building is a long way from the street. I could count on the fingers of one finger probably the amount of people I've seen on the sidewalks in that area of town. And much as we'd love to see people walking more and driving less, it's not a reality here. The reality is that people are going to come to this facility. They're going to park in the parking lot and they're going to walk in the entrance of the building. I think the architectural team has done a nice job of pushing the entrance right up as close as they can to Route 1 and making a significant feature out of it, which you can see on the rendering, to try and welcome people in from Route 1. And we do have a direct sidewalk connection coming down, as you can see, coming down along the access driveway, right to that entrance. So the idea of the entrance is to create a beacon and connectivity. But we really don't think that we can put a main entrance to the building here, right next to the street, have people park their cars and walk around the corner of the building to get in front of it. Just it doesn't work. If you, if you create a zoning environment where you're pushing the buildings right up to the street, then that is, that is very much an attainable goal. But we don't see it as being um, attainable here. On the uh, traffic peer review comments, as I kind of hinted at when I started this, again, we appreciate the comments. And it's, this is a very much more complex building than it may be understood to be by the peer review traffic engine. If this was a 15,000 square, square foot administrative office building, all these comments would be valid. Um, the reason that they're not is because it's not a 15,000 square foot office building. And, and I'll have uh, Bill come up and, and just give his thoughts on the traffic and how it relates to the ordinance in a second. I did want to point out one thing in the ordinance, though, because the ordinance has been quoted a couple of times here. And the first sentence is quoted accurately. But I'm just going to quote the whole standard because it's, it's important, particularly related to this development. 
So what the standard says is where a site has frontage on two or more streets, the planning board will require that access to the site be provided off the street where there is lesser potential for traffic congestion and hazards to traffic and pedestrians. It follows on by saying, for developments with significant traffic volumes of 50 or more peak trips, the planning board will consider access to more than one street, providing a traffic study clearly demonstrates a traffic safety and congestion benefit will result. For one, from the very preliminary ana analysis that we've done, we think it will trip more than 50 trips per peak hour. So it, the consideration for two accesses does become valid. And we do think that there are safety and congestion benefits to having that access off Route 1. But the only comment that I really wanted to address in detail on the peer review traffic engineer comment was comment number six. Um, and that is a comment directly on what we put in the master plan narrative, which states... If the primary access were to be located on Lincoln Avenue, this would create uncertainty in, in approaching traffic, even with appropriate signage. The resulting confusion and potential for significant additional turning movements on the Route 1 corridor outweigh the benefits of providing the primary entrance off a less traveled street. And the response to that was, uh, we strongly disagree with the above statement on the basis that if this were an administrative office building, there wouldn't be any bypass traffic going to it. And the only number I, I'll quote to support the, the reason why we put that statement in there, and we think there will be a lot of bypass traffic. In the last year, Hospice of Southern Lane provided bereavement counselling services to 1,600 people. Every one of those 1,600 people came to their current facility for the first time during that year. So there will be at least, just for that function, there will be at least 1,600 people arriving at this facility who don't know where it is the first time they come. And that is why we put that statement in there. We think 1,600 is quite a significant number. And that's not counting other people who come for educational or visitors or people come looking for jobs. Um, we think that that would cause a significant issue on Route 1 if people weren't clear about where the entrance to the building was. So that's the reason for the statement. That I say it's, it's something that I don't think was entirely understood by the peer review traffic engineer. And actually, one of the things that we would like to do, presuming we get past this process and the master plan process, is set up a meeting with, the, with staff and the peer review traffic engineer just to go through some of the complexities of what the program entails, make sure that they're getting all the information they need to get to be able to respond accurately to, to what we think is going on at the building. That's everything covered from my end, apart from traffic, and I'm just going to let Bill give a couple of comments on traffic from his preliminary analysis. Thank you, uh, Andy. Good evening. Bill Bray with Traffic Solutions. Um, I just want to just focus on three items, and they all relate to the access and the issues that need to be reviewed uh, related to determining the uh, point of access. Uh, the first one, again, in accordance with the site plan ordinance, is the projection of trips uh, generated by the pro uh, proposed project uh, and what that volume is. And, and in, if it exceeds 50, then uh, the planning board uh, can uh, look at the access for the site. Hold on to my script notes here. Um, we have completed that estimate of of site trips based on the Institute of Transportation's uh, trip generation publication. Uh, and we're quite confident, in fact, that the project will generate uh, considerably more than 50 peak hour trips, especially during the afternoon uh, peak hour. There is another time period during the morning. It's not typically related to the traditional morning commuter hours, but it does occur later in the morning uh, when, again, the project will come very close to uh, generating uh, 50 peak hour trips during that time period as well. We've conducted prior studies for the site, actually three or four years ago, uh, that shows that more than 60, uh, the existing site at 180 U.S. Route 1, uh, that the existing uh, orientation of traffic coming to and from the site 
is oriented to, uh, from the north, to and from the north, when about 65% of the trips that enter and or exit the site actually have that northerly orientation on Route 1. Uh, that's a very important uh, consideration because without a U.S. Route 1, then we would basically be putting about 65% of the trips through uh, the intersection, uh, civilized intersection of Higus at U.S. Route 1. The next area of discussion that I'd like to just talk a little bit about is the uh, very detailed safety review that we did. I recall at a, a meeting in August, the planning board specifically asked that we look at the, the safety trends both at the intersection of Higus and Route 1 and also for the section of Route 1 between the Willowdale and the Haggis Parkway uh, signalized intersections. We asked uh, for and received from the main DOT a, the most current uh, three-year roadway safety statistics for both the signalized intersection at Haggis Parkway and for the street section of U.S. Route 1 between, again, the two signalized intersections. For that three-year time period, the intersection of Route 1 and Haggis Parkway, there were a total of 26 vehicle accidents. Main DOT's uh, critical rate factor, which is simply just a comparison uh, with a study intersection with a state statewide average, was 0 0.80. Main has two criteria, Main DOT has two criteria for determining a high crash location. There has to be a minimum of eight crashes occurring over that three-year study period and a critical rate factor in excess of one. The intersection doesn't meet the latter uh, standard for a high crash location, but certainly that number is approaching that 1.0 uh, threshold criteria. We completed detailed um, collision diagrams for each of the 26 accidents. Uh, based on a detailed review of the uh, police uh, reports for each of the 26 accidents. Twelve of the 26 accidents uh, occur in the southbound lanes of Route 1, uh, and each of those accidents were classified as rear-end crashes, uh, again occurring in that southbound lane at uh, Haggis Parkway and Lincoln Avenue. The next piece of information that we asked from, uh, for a report from DOT was how many accidents occurred between, again, the two signalized intersections on U.S. Route 1. MDOT reports that over that one-fifth of a mile or about 1,100 feet of U.S. Route 1, segment of U.S. Route 1, there were 12 vehicle accidents that happened over that uh, three-year time period of 2015 through 2017. Just as a point of reference, there are 10 private driveways that intersect Route 1. There are, it's a five-lane cross-section. There are two through lanes uh, in each direction and the center two-way left turn lane uh, for access into the properties on both sides of U.S. Route 1. Our review of those accident reports shows that there are zero, or that there were zero left turn crashes uh, reported in the DOT summary uh, for that full section of U.S. Route 1. Lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about the congestion of the intersection at U.S. Route 1 and Haggis Parkway and the potential of, of what the congestion levels might be at uh, a proposed entrance out onto U.S. Route 1. We have not conducted a detailed capacity analysis of yet. Uh, we're in the process of doing that. Uh, we want to refine our trip generation and assignment uh, as accurately as we can, and then we'll conduct that analysis. I think any of, the, of you that have traveled U.S. Route 1 uh, at the Haggis Pocket Way intersection during the summer months, especially during the evening peak hour, the southbound traffic on U.S. Route 1 uh, backs up somewhat significantly. Past studies, even though the intersection underwent uh, considerable improvements about seven years ago, uh, the level of delay uh, in the southbound direction in the evening peak hour is somewhat considerable. 
again, that intersection, in my opinion, certainly experiences a level of delay uh, that is probably approaching level of service E uh, below the town standards of level of service D on certain approaches uh, during the evening peak hour. We are highly confident that once an analysis is done of the intersection, uh, that it will validate uh, the statements that I just made. We're also very confident that when we complete a left turn capacity analysis, a left turn entry trip analysis into the Route 1 entrance to the site, uh, that the level of delay that people making that left turn will experience will be somewhat minor. Uh, the signal sequencing at Route 1 and Haggis Parkway, uh, depending on what signal phasing is, is uh, actually uh, in the green phase, signal phase, will provide sufficient gaps for people to make that left turn into the site. Again, it would be my professional opinion that the level of delay will be somewhat insignificant uh, for those folks that are uh, waiting to make that left turn uh, into uh, the site from US Route 1. Although it's not really here on my notes, but I also just want to briefly talk about vehicle sight lines. Uh, I was involved in the uh, previous review of this site. Uh, there is uh, a clear line of sight on US Route 1 at the proposed incident driveway that uh, very conservatively is at least 1,500 feet in either direction where the, there's a clear line of sight. Uh, there is, again, Route 1 was designed to a high standard uh, providing uh, exceptional uh, sight distance. Over on the Lincoln Avenue approach, uh, the sight lines for those on, on the board that uh, attended the site walk, it's very evident uh, that folks coming out of a proposed driveway uh, onto Lincoln Avenue uh, will experience uh, site restrictions both looking right and left from the driveway apron. Especially look uh, to the left, uh, there is a lot of low level vegetation and a number of of mature trees that will have to be removed to just provide acceptable sight lines in that direction. I think at this point I will just uh, turn it back to uh, Andy to uh, uh, summarize the submittal. Thank you. I think Bill just summarized it for me. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure it was brief, but I hope it was thorough. Um, so if you, if you have any questions, please fire away. Thank you. Uh, before we do that, um, is there anyone from the public who has any comment on this item? All right, seeing none. Um, Rick, would you like to sure. start us off? I'll go first, but I want to reserve the right to go last, too, maybe. Sure. Um, I like what you've done with the building. Um, I know you've committed to try to reduce the parking if you can. You know, that's always big with us because it's storm water. Um, you know, I can see, and I'm in support of the ordinance, when it's a corner lot. But for this particular project, like I said at the onset, if I was coming from Ann John's, coming north, and I passed the hospice, I would turn around the bowling alley. And that's not a good thing. And other people make a U-turn. And that's not a good thing either, because it's illegal. Turning around the bowling alley is probably illegal. Hopefully there's no police watching tonight, but I'm in support of that entrance because I feel that without it, it creates an unsafe condition for the public and for anybody coming out of the bowling alley. Um, at this point, you know, until we get further on the project, I don't have a lot to say other than you did a good job presenting both the inventory and the master plan. Um, you're pretty clear and concise and didn't take a lot of time, and we appreciate that. And Mr. Bray, you did a great job as always, so um, I'm satisfied with what I see, and I would allow the driveway on Route 1. Thanks. And before we move on, I will just um, 
note, just in case it's not clear to, to folks, that um, at this stage, if we do give master plan approval, obviously there are a lot of details still to be worked out at the site plan phase, but certainly we will be sort of locking in the access pattern. So uh, yes. people should, as, as Rick did, indicate where they, where they are on that, and we can certainly have further discussion on that as we go forward. Rachel? Yeah, um, I too think uh, Mr. Bray has done a good job. I, I actually need to read the study. Um, I tried to uh, take the take down some of the significant uh, figures that you uh, that you quoted. Um, I guess I, I have a question, uh, a problem with the concept of pass by. To me, a pass by is. Uh, when somebody's driving along and says, oh, look, the Holy Donuts, and pulls in, um, that it is a sort of an ad hoc decision. So somebody who actually has an appointment there for bereavement, I wouldn't class as pass by. Uh, I don't know if there's a definition any place that, that does, actually indicates what pass by is. Um, so I, I did a very fast math with 1,600 people coming for grief counseling in the course of the year. That's 4.38 people per day, uh, which is not a significant pass-by. Uh, I am at this point unpersuaded about uh, Route 1 as an access. I would like to really take a hard look at the data and a look at uh, what it might mean um, even with all the signage in the world, people are still going to drive by and turn around in, in the bowling alley. Uh, they, you can't stop people from being distracted, getting lost, and making some bad choices about how they're going to turn around instead of waiting for the next light. So uh, I, I can't say absolutely no, but I won't say absolutely no to a right turn access out of uh, onto Route 1, but I remain very concerned about safety and traffic, uh, traffic concerns for anything that would be a left turn access from Route 1. So at this point, um, I would go with the, until you can show me the safety benefits, uh, I would go with the access on Lincoln. Thanks, Rachel. I think I'm going to go ahead and chime in now uh, because I, I think it's important, at least to me, that to note that it is difficult to make a decision on this without having the actual analysis in front of us. And it's not that I have any doubt that Mr. Bray is being completely forthright, and we know based on the track record that um, it'll be a thorough analysis, but um, we do generally make a practice of making sure that we have the opportunity to really digest and have our peer reviewers digest those analyses, whether it's for traffic or stormwater or what have you. Um, and I think, you know, while I respect um, what Mr. DePerry said about, you know, maybe making a distinction between this type of site and a site that's truly a corner lot, um, I think to me the way I read the ordinance, it still really clearly puts the onus on the applicant to demonstrate through data uh, that there's a compelling traffic safety um, uh, rationale for having for having that that access. So, um, and I, you know, and I, and it's, I realize it's one of these tough situations, that, and I, I think we all are generally feeling very supportive of this project. It's certainly a very laudable mission, and it's a, I think you've done a great job with the architecture and the site in general, and you've done a, done a good job of articulating your your reasoning on everything, but I'm, at least where I am right now, just as I happen to be the chair, but I'm just one vote and I'm one board member, um, I personally feel like I need to see the data, um, see the reports, and, um, you know, I, again, realizing that you have had to wait an extra three weeks to get to this meeting, um, but that's sort of where I am. Uh, I'm, I'm good with everything else. I appreciate the fact that you're trying to reduce the parking. Um, and if I could just interject a little there. What we were trying to do with this, so, so we bought Bill and, and Bill did the preliminary analysis, but we were trying to tailor all our submissions to kind of this master plan, mm -hmm. the master plan format. Right. And we appreciate that we, you know, when we get to site plan review, then 
the peer review engineers have to see all the stormwater calculations right. and all uh, and the traffic impact analysis and all those more detail you know the site lighting cut fixtures and all that stuff but that that's more kind of the way we say that's usually more geared to site plan review right I, I appreciate that and analysis. I guess it's it's just that it's with this particular site, um, I realize there's a, maybe it feels like a little bit of a chicken and egg dilemma, um, but the fact that we once we approve this, the master plan, as I said earlier, we, we're sort of locking in that that's where the access is. And given that, I, I just feel that the stakes are pretty high here. Um, and I, I do, I absolutely appreciate where you're coming from. And I know you've been through this process with us before. Um, and so I do appreciate you trying to anticipate that and trying to be responsive, but um, I just think that, the, you know, the way the ordinance is written and the way that the site is situated that, uh, and we may very well come around as a board to saying, um, you've made a compelling case and, and we can we can waive that based on the data. I don't, I'm not personally anyway prepared to do that tonight and I'll, you know, we'll see what, what others say, but. Sure. Thanks. Nick? Thank you, yeah, I have to just echo what they're saying right now. Um, the language in our site plan ordinance is very cut and dry. It says where a site has frontage on two or more streets, the planning board will require that access to the site be provided off the street where there is a lesser potential for traffic congestion and for hazards to traffic and pedestrians. That's the first sentence. So, you know, arguing that um, <coughs> without a cut in from Route 1 that somehow we're gonna, that somehow that cut is lessening the potential for traffic congestion. I'm, I'm not sure of it. Additionally, like Corey had said, we haven't seen the actual traffic study, and I appreciate Bill and his time, um, but that is something that not only the, we the board like to see, but the peer reviewers like to see as well. Um, and then, it's, by the sounds of it, you have um, the second sentence is about 50 or more peak trips. It has to do with that. I said the planning board will consider access to more than one street, providing the traffic study clearly demonstrates a traffic safety and congestion benefit result. Benefit. Right. It's not. It's not even a net neutral. It's a benefit. Sure. So, and I think that's. I think that's a really lofty standard. And I, and I'll say this. I didn't write this, but what I do know is that this went through quite a bit of process to sit here and become the standard which we're supposed to uphold. So, in order for me to be convinced that we should be ignoring this section or that you've cleared the hurdle to get past this section, I want to see it. I want to see it and I want to be convinced of it and at this moment in time, I'm just not. So, that's my two cents. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Roger? <laughs> I, um, I, I, this is a dilemma and um, because of what the ordinance, the way the ordinance reads, it almost dictates that we don't have any choice. But I, um, based on uh, what I've heard from Mr. Bray and what I stated uh, at the last time you were before us, I think our problem is with Route 1. Uh, and um, my other dilemma, I, I, if I had my druthers, I, I would say go with Route 1. And the reason for that is um, the other businesses, for instance, as far as I know, Sullivan Tire across the street can come out, they can take left turn lanes out of that property. I think the bowling alley can take left turn lanes out. Every other business along there can take left turn lanes out. That stretch of Route 1 has the, the center turn lane, which was designed for that purpose. Um, and um, so that's the struggle. I mean, if it wasn't for the ordinance and the wording in the ordinance, I would be leaning towards um, favoring the Route 1, unless something comes out with your further study to indicate otherwise. Can I just jump in for sure, a second? Yeah, go ahead. I would like to note that that ordinance does state frontage on two or more streets. So that some of those lots may not have frontage on anything else but Route 1. No, I understand that, but what I'm saying, but from my point of view, these are all businesses on Route 1. Okay. I just wanted to point And they're out. all taking advantage of that, that center turn lane. Okay. And this one business, because they happen to, you know, be on that, have access to another road. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're... We're punishing them in a way that the other businesses on Route 1 are not being punished. That's the only point I'm making. And I, frankly, I think, I wish the ordinance wasn't as restrictive as, as it is, but that's the ordinance, that's the way it's written. 
So that's that's a dilemma. Yeah, and, and just to clarify that, and I touched on that with the hierarchy of the ordinances, that this is a performance standard in the site plan review ordinance, and and the the board, if it chooses to do so, can waive any of those standards as they say fit, see fit. It's not like it's in the zoning ordinance where you don't have the ability to waive any of those standards. So, not that I'm suggesting you. You know, that's the direction to go in. I'm just saying you have the ability. So it's not a hard and fast ordinance that you have to necessarily apply. The, the, other, the other point I would make is when Mr. Gray has uh, been involved with other Route 1 <coughs> businesses, I mean, this, this has been a major issue for him. Uh, you know, uh, left turn, you know, left turn lanes out, mm -hmm. right turn. And, um, and I think, I mean, I would like to see you know, I agree with everybody else. We should see the final report and see if there's anything really significantly mm -hmm. changed to make this, um, you mm -hmm. know, to make this basically a, a null and void discussion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is something, Joel? So my question is, what about, uh, if you want to see it become something positive, uh, what about turning that to a right of way, right turn only onto the road for people who miss the Hayes Parkway? So they're not turning around in uh, other lots. Turn part of the lot into just a right of way so people could use that area to turn around, go on the Lincoln, and then go up the Hagas Parkway. Would that be something that would bring something positive to the property? I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure if I, are you, I don't are you not quite sure I follow what you're describing. <coughs> well, they're looking for a net positive, right? Yeah. Uh, turn it. What about turning that into sort of a New Jersey jug handle, more or less? Or and putting a, like a reverse direction? I, you know, that would, that would take up a, a pretty considerable amount of space. But then you'd be doing the same thing, right? Because you'd, then you'd have to turn left back out onto Route 1, yeah. which is actually, you know, of all the movements, is probably the, the one that's of most concern. I don't think, as Bill indicated, with the with the accident data. There hasn't been a single accident in that stretch of anyone turning left into a site off Route 1. There's only been 12 accidents in that whole segment compared to 26 at the, at the Hagers Parkway intersection. So I'm, I'm not a traffic engineer, but reading between the lines, it seems to me like Hagers Parkway intersection is less safe than turning left off Route 1. I mean, and that may be the conclusion, uh, but we, again, right. I, I think... I know that I and I think the majority of other board members right now are of the opinion that we we just need to see it. So, so what do we need? What do we need to do? Is the, does, is the board suggesting that do we have to table and come back, or is the board going to recommend that we table and come back, or what's the best would, way to handle that? Right. I mean, I, I don't think we need a in terms of the procedural aspect of it. I don't think we need to formally table anything. I just think it, we're we're not we're not indicating master plan approval at this time with the expectation that, that you and your team will provide uh, the traffic study yep. results to us and to staff and we will review and we'll be in a better position to to act. Yeah, and I think time. it would be helpful from our end if we actually mm -hmm. sit, if we can arrange a meeting and sit down with staff and the traffic review engineer and go through all these to make sure we only do this once, that so we're not we're not doing it and then responding to the comments and doing it again and responding right. to the comments. And I know I, I think I can speak for staff that that's something that they you know and you've had this experience yeah. I know that they do that all the time and I think um, they want to help put us in a position to be able to make a fully informed decision. So again, I really I, I don't want this to come across as us being kind of arbitrary and nope. imposing onerous requirements, but it's something that it's data that's already sort of there and my understanding is just sort of needs to be packaged together and um, I think it'll help us make a, a better informed decision. So thank sure. you for your understanding. Corey, oh, Corey. thanks. Can I, uh, could I, could I just get a clarification? Yes. Mr. Johnson made a, a comment about the, the board sort of could waive that requirement. Is, can I get a clarification on that? Do we, can we do that or? We can, well, I, I, there are a lot of cases where we have the discretion to waive something, but I, the way that it's written, 
we need to have data that we can that we can rely upon. But so it's the, in other words, because the way I, re I read this is no matter what the data is, it will require us, you know, going on, you know, having access off the least traveled road. But so it's it's not correct with the proper data. We could basically, you know. Um, you know, modify this requirement. Is that is that right? Right. I think okay. it depends on what the okay. what the what the data show. Okay. And I think you know, it, there's always there's always going to be some degree of subjectivity or discretion that individual board members have when they're reviewing these things to determine whether it convinces them. Um, but I think as a as a general rule, I mean, I've been on the board for ten plus years and. I think particularly when it comes to traffic safety, um, it's been a it's been a fairly hard, high bar and a pretty bright line. Sure. So um, again, if the data are there, um, which it sounds like it may it may be, uh, then we'll go from there. But I think, I yes. do deserve the right. Um, and I don't want to drag these out, um, but I do feel so strongly about this. I have to just, I understand and respect the opinion of everybody on the board. I think we need that information and that analysis, and they should get with staff and, and go through that. But to me, you would have sad people turning around in a parking lot full of five-year-olds going to a birthday party. I've been there with five-year-olds. That's all I said. I just think we should consider it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Item number eight. Alaire Scarborough requests a site plan amendment review for 10 Southgate Road, Assessor's Map, U37, Lot 7. Jamel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project is located in the industrial zone off of Southgate Road. Uh, so the applicant was last before the board for sketch plan review in August. Uh, so just a few comments to go through. Um, one of them, um, it looks like the proposed with the proposed building addition, uh, the site would require 321 parking spaces. Uh, the applicant has stated that 319 parking spaces are proposed and required, um, but staff is under the understanding that two more spaces are needed on the site, uh, so the applicant should, be, should discuss this with the board. The designer has worked with town staff to provide a mid-block crosswalk design across Southgate Road uh, that addresses staff's concerns about site distance. However, this crosswalk is installed specifically for the sole use of the Abbott development, connecting their private parking lot to the facility. So staff recommends that a memorandum of understanding be executed that outlines the maintenance and repair responsibilities of the crosswalk system by the applicant to ensure this crossing remains as safe as possible uh, for pedestrians in the future. Uh, the town's fire department has requested that the applicant coordinate with them to work through some details of the proposed building addition, as noted in staff comments. And the applicant should also uh, coordinate with the Scar Scarborough Sanitary District about the proposed sanitary pump station located north of the proposed building addition. And that's what I have right now. Thanks, Jamel. And I'll turn over to the applicant. Okay, you got a PowerPoint, Jamel, so... Okay. You can plug right in. Should override. I'm Norm Chamberlain with Walsh Engineering, um, representing Abbott, uh, formerly Alaris Carbro. Um, they are proposing to put an addition on their existing facility there at Town 10 uh, Southgate Road. Uh, this is the existing site here, the existing building. Um, they currently have a portable office trailer right here. 
Um, parking is, is uh, out front, some around back, and they have the satellite across the street. They are proposing this addition here in the dark uh, yellow. Um, I've outlined in light yellow, uh, they're actually going to be coming back uh, soon, hopefully, for uh, a an second addition to the addition. Um, but we're only asking for this addition at this point. Uh, their goal is to get the first floor uh, manufacturing space online by next uh, <laughs> flu season. So they hope to be in production by uh, late summer. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ryan Senator. He's going to talk a little bit about the proposed building. Uh, good evening. I'm Ryan Senator, the project architect. Um, and uh, the, the plan is basically the same plan we, we brought to you before. Um, uh, and uh, essentially, the uh, addition is off the rear corner of the existing facility. It's a uh, three story addition, uh, basically, uh, production use on the first floor, uh, office use on the second floor, and then uh, storage and warehouse space on the third floor. Um, Um, so this is the, uh, the second floor plan showing the, the office use primarily open concept with uh, some perimeter offices um, and then the storage uh, on the third floor. Um, the exterior of the building, we're kind of um, using the same uh, material palette that's on the existing structure. Um, it, you know, a little bit uh, different design, but in terms of the material colors, uh, trying to keep those the same to kind of uh, blend the building uh, with the existing. Um, these are just kind of the various uh, elevations. Um, here's a rendering kind of from the rear corner of the property showing the, the composition of the uh, materials and, and use. Um, and another rendering kind of from the, uh, there's an existing kind of cooler structure that you can see with, with, uh, in the foreground here in the building is off to the right, the addition. Um, the new, uh, the new entry area for the primarily employee entrance. Um, so you can see the existing building um, uh, to the right here and then the proposed structure to the left. Um, and this is a, an additional rendering we did um, kind of uh, showing the addition um, with the um, existing contacts in the foreground that the board had requested. So you can kind of see the material materiality uh, 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 kind of relationship as well as how the building is kind of set back from uh, the front face of the building. So uh, part of what we've done uh, since we were here for sketch plan is um, to look at the existing uses within the building. This is the existing use. The red is the uh, office space and the yellow is production and warehouse. Um, they are going to be moving uh, this area right here, uh, this office space, into the new addition and turn it into production space. And uh, when we do that, um, we came up with a count of 319 spaces based on warehouse and, and office. Uh, Jamel came up with 200, uh, 321. Um, we can find additional spaces on, uh, on the site and we'll show you where. Um, um, uh, actually right here is where we're going to put three parking spaces right in front of this generator. Uh, Ryan had that. Uh, it's right, right there. There's the generator. Um, they're really not using that uh, for anything other than access to the generator. Um, so that brings our count up to 322. Um, uh, one more than we need. Uh, we actually had planned on restriping uh, the parking right out here in front. There's some uh, uh, handicap spaces, but they basically just painted every other space as, a, uh, as an aisle, so there, there's a lot more room than needed, and we can restripe that and gain one more space. Uh, we, we may take that out of the count because uh, we, we found another spot over here for the, the right here for three spaces. Um, so. Uh, if we take the 318, add the 3 or 321, that's what we need. Um, we, uh, we have been in contact with the fire department. We've been uh, 
haven't been able to meet yet. Um, I, I did send them this uh, exhibit showing how we can get a, uh, a fire truck around the outside of the building without even impacting uh, spaces that have cars in them. Um, so uh, <coughs> we just haven't been able to make that contact yet, but we, we will coordinate with them and, and get their buy into the whole plan. Uh, we've developed this plan for the crosswalk to the satellite parking lot. Um, it's my understanding uh, staff has reviewed this and, and is fine with it. Um, what we're going to be doing is putting uh, two signs up here by the crosswalk with the flashing LEDs and we're going to put a third sign down around the corner where there is an existing uh, pedestrian crossing ahead sign. I replace that with the flashing LEDs so that uh, people coming up to the corner can see it prior to rounding the corner. Uh, as I said before, this is mostly uh, an issue in the winter months, um, <coughs> but um, you know, having the flashing lights should make the whole crosswalk safer. Um, this is the overall site plan. Uh, basically, we're taking sewer and sprinkler service from out in front of the building. Uh, because this is very flat, I mean, the 100-year floodplain is right across the street here, uh, we have to pump the sewage out to the existing manhole in the parking lot. Uh, this is all a private system, um, but we've been in contact with the Scarborough Sanitary District and, and Dave Hughes hasn't had any issues with what we're proposing. We've also been in contact with the uh, uh, Portland Water District and uh, taking the sprinkler off of this existing service is no issue to them as long as we take our domestic service from behind the meter inside the building and route water through, um, through the building to the uh, proposed addition. So. Um, We've, we've got some emails, I think I sent those to Jamel and, um, and a letter from SSD, so. Uh, this is a close-up of the site. Uh, there was a question uh, in an earlier memo about this drain pipe underneath the building. Um, unfortunately, we have a loading dock that's over in this area, and this area is the low point of the site. Um, there's a retaining wall right here that goes into the existing uh, cooler building and there's a pipe end that comes out of that and water drains into that over to this catch basin uh, down here and then out to Southgate Road. Uh, we didn't have enough uh, drop to even get around this first stage addition, let alone the, the second phase. Uh, so the only solution we had was to pick up this water at this retaining wall and, and pipe it through the building. We're planning on putting in an 18 inch pipe uh, which is much larger than, larger than needed. And uh, if they need to sleeve it at some point in the future, they'll have that ability. Uh, again, not an ideal situation, but it, this is right down next to the marsh and we have very little elevation change. Uh, that's basically all we have and open it up for questions. Great, thank you. Um, is there any public comment on this? All right. Roger. Um, I, I don't really have too much. Uh, I think you've done a good job in the presentation. I think the building looks terrific. Um, I, w I wish it had more exposure too, so the public could see it because it really look, does look good. Um, I would, um, I would uh, go along with the waivers they're looking for regarding the landscape plan, as well as the. Um, Stormwater. Okay. Okay. And that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else over here? No? Good. Rachel, did you have something? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question on the uh, on the landscaping waiver. What's there now? Right now, there is a shrub right there. You can see on the plan. Uh, it's. <laughs> doing okay for being on the north uh, <laughs> northeast side of the building. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not dead yet. <laughs> but um, that's but, part of the But reason. on life support. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's, it's, it's hanging in there. 
Um, but that's the reason we've asked for a waiver. The only uh, green areas we have are on the north side of the building, so there's not a lot that we can plant there. Okay. I, I have no objection to the waiver. I was just kind of wondering what was hanging on there now. Um, the, the original plan, as I recall, listed the third floor as simply totally unoccupied, and now it's listed as warehouse space. Does that mean there's going to be any additional staff involved, or is it? No, the, uh, the sense we got from the board at Sketch Plan was uh, saying that we weren't going to use it, wasn't going to fly, so we, we brought it into uh, just storage space um, and uh, made the parking work. I have no further questions. Thanks. Sure. So um, with that as storage space, I think you come into compliance with parking. Correct. Perfect. And then um, I think you did a really good job. Um, the timing of the signs for the crosswalk, we're going to do that like even before you start, as soon as possible. That's the idea. Right. We already have two signs. They just have to order the third one in, uh, okay. in the radio controller that goes along with it. Okay. Um, so I, I would think that soon, you know, if we have permission from the town, I, they want a memorandum of, of understanding. So if you send us that, uh, we'll get that executed, and yeah. That's good. Uh, we're I off to the races. I, um, I missed the part where the other two were already there. So. Well, no, they, they bought them. They bought them last uh, winter, and, and we're hoping to install them. But uh, uh, the town said, wait a minute, we got to look at this. So that's... Yeah. We, we rolled it into this project. Yeah. Okay. I guess that's where I'd like to add. It should be a licensed contractor to be able to work in the right of way and have the ability to do that kind of the electrical work. So we can take care of that during pre-con. Okay. Yep. Just send me what you need, and, and okay. I'll get it to have it. That's a good point. <laughs> I still would like to see. I'd like to see the signs up before too much because you're going to have a lot of people walking around. And, it's oh. not a big deal. It's just timing-wise, if you can put them up first, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, they're already there okay. uh, as far as, uh, you know, the people using that parking lot are already using it. So uh, right. we, we'd like to get it up before the clocks change because then all of a sudden it's dark. And it's fine. I know. <clears throat> That's good. Now I'm all done. That's good. Nice job. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I really don't have anything else that has not been covered. I'm glad you can accommodate the, the parking requirement and you'll be in compliance there. I agree that it's a nice looking design and uh, particularly given that it's an industrial area. Um, so without any further ado, I will put a motion forward. <clears throat> I move to approve the project titled Abbott Phase 1 Building, proposed by Alaire Scarborough, Inc., as depicted on the plan set prepared by Walsh Engineering Associates. Dated September 24th, 2018, <clears throat> with the following findings and conditions. Findings as stated herein, they'll be part of the record, I won't read those. Uh, conditions, number one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to address the parking field comment noted in the staff review comments memorandum dated October 9th, 2018. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number two, Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall provide the planning department with a memorandum of understanding that outlines the maintenance and repair responsibilities of the mid-block crosswalk system across Southgate Road by Abbott, as noted in the staff review comments memorandum dated October 9, 2018. Number three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall coordinate with the fire department to discuss phasing, fire lanes, fire suppression, and the proposed parking layout. Any required changes to the plan shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall coordinate with the Scarborough Sanitary District to discuss the proposed sanitary pump station located north of the proposed building addition. And condition number five, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That's the motion. Second. Second. All right. All of that. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Good luck. All right. Item number nine. 
GNC LLC requests an advisory opinion for a miscellaneous appeal for a conversion of a non-conforming use for 336 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 1. Jamal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, this project is located in the B3 Zoning District. Um, they've applied for a miscellaneous appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals for the expansion of a non-conforming use. So in accordance with the zoning ordinance, before making a decision on any miscellaneous appeal, the zoning board shall refer the appeal to the planning board for an advisory opinion. The advisory opinion should be based on the non-conformance standards found in the zoning ordinance. So the existing non-conforming use on the property is a motor vehicle sales, repair, and service facility. A little background. In the summer of 2017, the applicant expanded the existing parking area on the site onto the abutting property, which is also owned by the applicant. In the fall of 2017, the town issued a notice of violation for expanding the parking without an amended site plan approval and for the expansion of the non-conforming use without approval from the ZBA. In order to address these code violations, the applicant is now seeking this miscellaneous appeal from the ZBA. The board should refer to section 4I in the zoning ordinance to reference the review criteria for the expansion of the non-conforming use when considering this proposal tonight. And sort of as a housekeeping note for the future, staff also su suggests that a legal instrument be, be put in place allowing for the use of the abutting property in the event of future transfer of either property. That's it for now for me. Thanks, Jamel. And I'll hand it off to Ms. St. Clair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair. I'm with St. Clair Associates. I'm here tonight on behalf of GNC LLC. Uh, Dennis Hall is uh, one of the members of the LLC. Mr. Hall also owns the abutting property uh, located at 334 U.S. Route 1. Uh, the ownership name on that is 334 U.S. Route 1 Scarborough LLC. So the two LLCs are linked by Mr. Hall. Uh, and we're here tonight, just as Jamal uh, indicated, to seek an advisory opinion from you folks uh, in order to allow us to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, to address a change that was made to the site uh, back last year. Uh, the change is uh, in technicality and extension or expansion of an existing grandfathered non-conforming use. Uh, so we do need to file a miscellaneous appeal with the Board of Appeals and we also need to come back to you folks after that uh, for an amended site plan. Uh, so our purpose tonight is to seek an advisory opinion from you folks but also to gather some initial input on your expectations on an amended site plan uh, as we will be coming back to uh, you folks for that. So uh, as Jamel indicated, the sites are in the B3 General Business District. You can see on the uh, colored rendering here, the darker area is the GNC LLC site. That's the site that has, there's an existing house on the property on the front. Uh, which is uh, rented as a residential use. Uh, the Crossroads Automotive is in the building at the rear of the site. Uh, the cursor is on that, uh, on Jamel's plan. Uh, the site was previously approved for its use back in 1985. There was a special exception granted to a prior site owner uh, named uh, Clifford Wilcox. In 1998, Mr. Hall actually had his uh, business on the property and he actually obtained <coughs> an amended site plan approval uh, to expand the building that we just talked about. So the last approval on record was a planning board approval back in 1998. Uh, so Crossroads Automotive has been operating on the site for a number of years and uh, within the last year um, there was some drainage repairs that needed to happen. I believe it was associated with a floor drain uh, on the property. As I mentioned, Mr. Hall still owns both properties. The improvements were made in order to address that foundation drain, but in the process as they were working the site, um, they had considered expanding the uh, slope area that's shown sort of in this triangular wedge right here. So in expanding that slope area, it provided for an improved uh, maneuvering area within the site. Uh, Mr. Hall has indicated that during winter maintenance uh, it gets pretty tight uh, with the vehicles on the property. So the purpose of the expansion was to improve circulation within the site. If you look back to the 1998 plan, 
uh, there was a pinch point that was shown right basically in this area here, which was 17 and a half feet. It's shown on the site plan as that dimension. And that's not even the current requirement for a fire lane, which is 20 foot minimum. With the expansion that they made, they erroneously did it before they had any approvals uh, in place. And so we are here tonight uh, to seek the advisory opinion from you folks. Tomorrow night, we're actually scheduled to be before the Board of Appeals uh, to seek the miscellaneous appeal. And then we'll be back to you folks for an amended site plan, assuming that the uh, Board of Appeals is, uh, uh, yields a positive uh, finding. So. As Jamel noted, um, the area is on the abutting property owned by the applicant. We do have in the packet of materials a memorandum of agreement basically indicating that the applicant will set aside the area in an easement. We've provided uh, meets and bounds information for that sort of wedge-shaped area as it overlaps onto uh, the abutting property. but that. Um, once all the approvals are in place, that instrument would be set aside so that it would be recorded and any land transfers moving forward would be uh, part of uh, that documentation. So the miscellaneous appeal actually has two parts. One is the expansion of a non-conforming use because the parking area got bigger. We're not proposing to expand any of the buildings. The business is not expanding. Uh, it's just simply an additional, more um, efficient maneuvering area within the site. The other part of it is the miscellaneous appeal to actually allow the parking on the abutting property. That is a provision that is in the ordinance. Uh, the Board of Appeals does have the authority to grant a miscellaneous appeal uh, to allow parking, if it's not feasible, to provide that within the constraints of the site. Uh, so we are seeking that as a two-part miscellaneous appeal. Uh, tomorrow night. So as I mentioned, we are looking at um, about uh, an easement area that's about 0 0.08 acres in size. It encompasses the expanded area uh, that was leveled off and the slope area. There's between five and eight feet vertically between the Crossroads Automotive site <coughs> and the abutting uh, property uh, to the um, east of the, of the uh, existing site, the 334 uh, U.S. Route 1 property. That property is uh, occupied, again, as a residential use. There's, you can see the house in the corner there on your screen, and that's that. This is the house right here. So this sort of lighter green area is the other property that's owned by Mr. Hall uh, and adjacent to the, the site in question. So as I mentioned, one of the things we'd like to do is obviously get your opinion. Uh, whether you feel that this is something that the uh, Board of Appeals should take time and consider, uh, but the also we'd like to get some input from you folks as to uh, what might be expected given the change that was made on the site uh, as part of an amended site plan approval. So uh, we have had in our packet uh, each one of the criteria that's in the ordinance uh, for <coughs> miscellaneous appeal has been addressed uh, as part of that uh, in the sense of timing and belabor that. But uh, if you folks have any questions, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment on this item before we go into board discussion? Seeing none, jump right in. Anyone down at this end? Rachel, why don't you start? <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, I I have no problem with the uh, the appeal. I think uh, the criteria for the appeal have met. Uh, in terms of what you might be looking at when you come back here, I'm looking at the amended plan, and it's a little unclear as to how many parking spaces are proposed along there. It looks as though you're still listing the old parking spaces as well as the new ones, as, as though they're still appearing. So my question is, uh, actually, are you looking at double stacking the parking? Are there two cars per space, or...? No, um, that just is with line weight. Um, it shows the original striping that is on the site now, or was on the site before the expansion happened, and then the darker line, it's hard to see probably on the plan, but the darker line is the proposed uh, striping for that. So basically those, those spaces that were there just sort of shifted uh, and sort of angled a bit differently. I can see the, uh, I 
can't read it, but I can see the 20, the 20 feet there. Um, and you're not asking for any other exit. There's simply the same driveway out. The, the configuration of the entrances is exactly as it is on the face of the earth right now, and that did not change uh, from the Nobile Avenue and uh, the entrance to Route 1. Those are the same widths that they were uh, on the original plan and were for the last several years. I will point out to you the double stacking that you see uh, to the side of the building on the Nobile Avenue side. That was as approved uh, on the original site plan. So that striping is double stacked. We intended that area to be a combination of vehicles on display and employees uh, such that you wouldn't have uh, sort of a, a, you know, an opportunity for a bit of confusion, if you will, uh, in that area. But that was the way it was originally approved on the site plan. Nothing changed over there. And at the very end of the, um, the parking area closest to the, the shop, you've just got... Um, it's a gravel pad right now. It's sort of expanded in a plateau area. Do you expect to do anything with that in terms of landscaping or seating, or uh, is it going to ultimately be used by any, for anything? I don't expect it to be used for any sort of display or parking area. Um, I'm not sure if the owner would use it um, for any part of the operation of the business, but I will verify uh, that as part of our site plan review. Thank you. Thanks. I can go now. Sorry, I thought I understood this one coming in, but then when Miss St. Clair got into it, I got a little bit lost, but then I got back to where I needed to be. So I originally thought that you were changing. You're not changing any lot lines. We're just allowing... Um, Enhancing uh, non-conforming use, basically. You're not, you're yes, not changing, you you're not physically um, surveying these lots and making them different. That is correct. The lot lines are remaining as they are originally. Okay. There will be an easement benefiting one lot on the other lot. All right. All right. That's where I thought we were when I... All right. Uh, yeah, no, they're both owned by the same person. Um, I think... Jamel referenced maybe there's a legal note that needs to go in that if one property is sold, they both need to be sold or they both need to be returned to the original state. I'm not sure exactly what it should say, um, but I Something think like that. in regards to say one of he sells one of the properties and yeah, it just should probably a deed is the right way to go. I'm not yeah. a real estate attorney. Um, right. No. No. I, I get you. That's, that's, what, be I, that's what I would be looking for. So yes. our vision for that would be that um, the site with the Crossroads Automotive on it is benefited by an easement that burdens the adjacent property, both owned by the applicant. If one of those properties is sold, that easement goes with the sale. So it still has to be an easement benefiting the property. It's a recorded document that would be a burden on that site. Is this an existing easement or the easement no, it's you're talking about the proposed? It's proposed. Right? And there's a, there's a document in the packet that the applicant agrees to put that easement in place. And I certainly would understand and agree that any part of an amended site plan approval would have that requirement that that easement be put in place. It can't really be put in place ahead of the approval, but it has to be put in place with the approval. All right, yeah, I definitely need, need that plan to that. So I got it. Thanks. Nick? Yeah, so I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear. So the um, the property, the abutting property that is not a car dealership, that's just a single family homestead? Is that what that property is currently? It's it's a rental, it's a residence though, yes. It is? Yes. Okay. So you have to, you know, maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but you could help me interpret it perhaps. By having those parking spots on that property, is that now a non-conforming lot? Or is that use now a non-conforming lot? I don't know the answer to that. So here's where I'm going with it. <laughs> um, and it looks like you've indicated that there might be a purchase and sale down the line. It says both the grantor and grantee agree to negotiate a more detailed purchase and sale agreement for this easement. So I understand you want to do it in an easement form. My concern is, is by allowing that use there, you've now turned in a second 
lot into a non-conforming lot. Um, and, and I guess I would like to know why, why not just peel off a chunk of that land and sell it back to yourself and make it part of that one piece. That way you have one non-conforming lot still and the other one remains as is. We actually looked at that. That was the first avenue of approach was actually just simply to convey a piece of land um, to the LLC that owns the property with the automotive facility on it. And the um, adjacent lot, the one with the, the house on it, doesn't have sufficient frontage on Route 1 uh, in order to appropriately address that wedge area. The frontage would have to follow the common lot line between the two lots until you made it to the setback, which is about 35 feet off of Route 1. And then we can make the land exchange. But that still necessitated an easement. And so in, because of the way that the parking is configured on the lot, so then you'd have an odd-shaped lot on both, both property lines. You would have an easement, you'd still have an easement that would burden that lot. And there would need to be a release between the mortgages on the property. With the granting of an easement along that line, it simplified things and made things make a lot more sense from a legal standpoint uh, with that. The language that's in that document that's in there that talks about any potential exchange or sale, um, I believe that's just simply because of the two LLCs and they'd have the right to um, exchange money if they needed to as part of that. But um, there's no plan that I'm aware of to sell either property. Um, the only proposal is to put an easement in place to address this on one of the applicant's properties to address a, a situation on the other applicant's property. But we don't know if that's now non-conforming. I'm sorry? But we, but we don't know if that's now non-conforming by allowing this use to go forward in this manner. I don't have the answer to that, no. Thanks, that's all for my questions. Thanks. Roger? Uh, I'm all set. Okay. Um, I hate to put you on the spot, and we're just sort of pulling here about the about Nick's comment, Nick's question or comment. I mean, I, I think there seems to be a general and, and a general uh, support for this like, overall. Um, with my caveat, with the yeah. caveat, mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately I don't, I don't know that anyone here is in a position to answer the question about whether whether the second lot is made non-conforming or how the um, how the ZVA or others might look at that yeah I would be with thoughts on that that's a really good question one that I haven't come across in at least a while um, so I've looked to our zoning administrator who's our expert on these kind of issues um, who's not here um, but I can certainly relay these concerns to the ZBA. Yeah, um, and I, I think they should be aware of it, and yeah. maybe the extra day you have something to do tomorrow, uh, <laughs> and you perhaps could try to straighten something like that out before you get to the ZBA, but at least make them aware of the potential issue before yep. they make a decision. That would be my personal preference on that. But Thanks. Outside of that one concern, if I, if I might just add to that, we certainly will follow up with the zoning administrator tomorrow in advance of the meeting. We already have received the comments from the zoning administrator. Um, the exact proposal that you see before you is what that was uh, presented to them as well. And that was not raised as an issue, but we will certainly bring it to the limelight to make sure it wasn't something that was missed. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's certainly the first time I've seen one of these where there's a existing nonconformity that potentially involves a second lot. So I appreciate you following up on that. And uh, Jamel, thanks in advance for helping to facilitate that. Yep. Um, but yes, as I, as I indicated, I'm, I'm OK with this, too, uh, with, that, with that caveat, um, particularly given that there's no increase in sort of the intensity of the use or the overall nature of the use. And we're really talking about 
improved maneuverability and circulation. Um, uh, I thought uh, Rachel's questions about the, uh, the, the parking configuration were good, and I think those that's it's probably probably fair to say that that'll be that'll be an area of focus mm -hmm. if, if and when you come back for site plan review. Um, just you know the devil in those details, and just making sure that there's a you know a good circulation plan and a you know a clear a clear parking plan. So with that, I think we've provided our advisory opinion, and we'll see where it goes next. Appreciate it. Thank Great. you. Thank you. We are coming up on 9 o'clock. I'd like to uh, suggest we take a brief, like, four, five-minute break, um, and then we'll reconvene. We've got a few more items to get through, um, and so please be ready uh, to continue within five minutes. Thank you. Is there any water in this building? Did the water come? Uh, yeah, there is. There is a. Um, yeah, I think it's
Scarborough Planning Board meeting of October 9th, 2018. We are now moving on to item number 10 on our agenda. Carmen T. Chapmas requests a sketch plan review for 34 New Road Assessor's Map R35, Lot 17. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project is located in the RF District, and as Corey said, in, at 34 New Road. So tonight, the proposal is before the board for a sketch plan review of the proposed subdivision, residential subdivision, including six lots and a 1,320-foot paved access road. Uh, just a few comments to go through here. Uh, to demonstrate the number of dwelling units possible on the site, uh, the zoning does require conventional subdivision plans, showing a lot layout, complying with the space and bulk regulations in the RF district. Uh, so the applicant should be sure to include this with future submissions. Uh, staff would like to note that one of the primary purposes of a conservation subdivision design is to limit impacts to wetlands and watercourses and to buffer these natural resources from development. In addition, the project is located in the Red Brook watershed, which has been listed as an impaired stream by the main DEP. Uh, so the applicant has provided two road locations to access the lots. The, the designer has provide, proposed wetland impacts for both the short road and long road access options as depicted on the screen. As the board may recall, during the 2016 sketch plan review, a key consideration of the road alignment discussion centered on the future development capacity of the remaining land on the parcel. Given that around 32 acres will remain undeveloped with this proposal, the applicant or future landowner may wish to further develop this portion of land in the future. The long, long road option would provide for better access to this portion of land and could result in less impervious surface and a full build out scenario. So the board should be sure to discuss this with the applicant tonight. And that's what I have right now. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to the applicant. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, I'm Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions. Uh, we have the privilege of uh, working with uh, Jay Chatmus, who is uh, Carmen Chatmus' husband, and uh, they obviously work together on this. Jay is with us this evening. Uh, as well as uh, Peggy McGeehy, who is a legal counsel, just to be able to take a look at some of the alternatives analysis um, that uh, we are uh, proposing just to be able to show, as you can see, the, uh, the red area on the, uh, the maps as opposed to that which is in blue. The green areas are then the overlap. Um, so just to be clear, as far as the drawing is concerned, what we're proposing is that uh, direct connection off of uh, New Road on the left-hand side of your screen, the lower left. That's the blue area crossing over to the upland area, which is where the green is located. And then the alternatives analysis is that longer red line or red road that is over by the, the ponds and the lake uh, that actually uh, cuts up and then curves around by the, uh, the stream uh, and then also includes the green part that would come down to that other uh, red indicated uh, hammerhead that's uh, just on the right hand side as you were coming down from inside the lot. Uh, keep in mind that the, the red line is indeed the, uh, uh, the alternative that we're not proposing. We just wanted to be able to show that uh, as, a, uh, as a potential alternative uh, based on what the board's reactions were a couple of years ago. So, uh, in essence, I'd love to give you just a, uh, a really quick background. There are a few faces that were here the last time we were here. This was literally about two years ago in, in October of 2016. Uh, at the time, what we were proposing is a very modest 1,300-plus uh, uh, foot road uh, that goes into the area that you can see in blue and green with accesses uh, simply just six lots, six small lots. This is not a large subdivision by any means, uh, but it is taking advantage of the upland area. Uh, the lots, as you see, do not have any wetlands on them whatsoever, and there are buffers from them that do not have any of those wetlands as well. Uh, so as far as the ordinance is concerned, the lots themselves and the buffers therefrom um, are not in directly impacted. The reason we took the, uh, the, the uh, stance that the road going through where we show it in the blue as opposed to the alternative in the red is that it is considerably shorter. Uh, please keep in mind that the overall uh, Red Brook impacted area is about uh, be between four and five square miles of, of uh, Red Brook. Um, we're looking at impacting uh, a little over 9,000 square feet of wetlands in that particular area. Those are the crossings that you will see uh, on your plan, you've actually got a, a colored rendition as a part of your packet uh, that shows those actual impacts uh, on the blue road. On the red road as well, what I'll refer to as the longer road, uh, there is a considerable number of challenges that we're looking at um, in terms of being able to uh, utilize that road. First of all, it's considerably longer, so the overall development impact is considerably greater. 
uh, you'll notice that the first pond, if it's coming off of a new road where the red road comes, uh, that first pond on the right-hand side of that, that lower pond, yes, thank you, uh, that is an area that is sandwiched between the abutting property and where the, uh, the driveway is right now. And this is basically, <coughs> excuse me, basically a dirt driveway. And the driveway snakes between that, uh, that actual pond and the abutting property. Uh, we did a calculation in order to be able to put an actual road in there to town specifications, even the narrower road, uh, where it curved and what have you. And what, what ends up happening is uh, we would end up impacting almost 15,000 square feet of that actual pond because, first of all, it's quite deep. Um, it's over 10 feet deep. These used to be borrow pits, by the way. So these were basically mined areas, these ponds. Uh, so they're not natural. None of them are. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the pond that we're looking at, that small kidney-shaped pond in the lower left there by the Red Road, uh, would need to either have a coffer dam built into it in order to be able to expand out the road, or it would just have to be filled. In either case, we're looking at about 15,000 square feet of impact, considerably great, just in that one area alone, considerably greater than the overall impact um, of the wetlands on the Blue Road or the Shorter Road. Uh, it also then, as it continues uh, up further into the lot, you can see it also then sandwiches between two of the other ponds. Um, those are the, the, uh, the lesser pond, which has got the uh, proposed division line going right through the middle of it. That actually is a fairly low pond. It's got some substantial wetlands that are immediately associated with it. The other ponds, not so much. The other ponds are the borrow pits that are considerably deep, uh, whereas if you, you, know, you went up to and you kind of took a step off, you'd go down pretty steeply. That other uh, the far pond on the left, not so much. The point being is that we're also looking at disturbing a, a bit of wetlands that's going through those two ponds in order to be able to hold the municipal standards for roads, even the lesser standards for that. Then as we get further into the lot, that road is actually curving up to getting into uh, the actual area of the urban impaired stream. Actually, it's not urban at this point. It's just an impaired stream, or so they call it. Um, and then the buffers there from. We want to stay away from that completely. We just don't want to go there at all. There's no necessity of doing so. So the impact of the red road, as it were, would be considerably greater uh, that we don't need to go. Uh, and don't need to go there as far as the shorter road. Uh, and again, that red road would be about 2,200 feet long, whereas the shorter road is um, a little bit more than half of that at uh, 1332. As far as the developing connection, uh, we have met with staff several times on this uh, recently. Uh, a couple of times, not just the, uh, uh, the meeting that we had back in 2016, which is fairly extensive, and I'll get to that in just a moment. One of the things that Jay Chase had mentioned uh, when we met with him, this was just a few weeks ago, is a, uh, proposing the connection at the end of the road that you'll see on the, uh, the draft that you've got in your packet. Um, there's a Paper Street connection that would go off of the end of the, uh, where, the, where the red road connects to the green road, as it were. Uh, that would continue in a small arc over toward uh, the rest of the property that right now we are not proposing to be developed at all. In fact, Mr. and Mrs. Chapman have said there is no way that they're going to be developing that portion of it. This overall property, they'd be retaining about 37 acres of that. Uh, a little less than half of that is the actual ponds itself. The point being is that it's not really conducive for that uh, greater future development, but if it were, then the logical connection for that would actually come off of that uh, rounded arc that you see at the top where the red road connects into the green one. So as Jay had suggested, we were happy to do this. We were happy to show this little uh, Paper Street arc that would ostensibly connect into the area of the lot that supports uh, Mr. Chavis's house right now and that he does not intend to develop. But you're absolutely right. At some point in the future, long after he's gone, he sold the property, uh, somebody may come along and say, well, how about developing this lot in the back? We'll take down the houses and the barns that are already there, and there are quite a number of them in that back area. Um, but uh, the, the road extension from the short road would only go essentially about as far as the shed that you see right in the middle of the retained property that's just a little bit uh, above the house that we show there. Um, that small connection would then stop there because it would provide plenty of frontage for the few remaining lots that could actually be built in that back area keeping in mind that Scarborough's uh, regulations prohibit us from uh, impacting any wetlands other than crossing them. We're not uh, able to impact those wetlands on lots per se. So any lots that would go in that back area would be easily connected from the shorter road. The longer road cannot snake between the two major ponds that you see right in the middle, the large pond and then the one just to the left of that. Um, there literally isn't any room there to be able to put that without literally filling uh, one or both of those ponds. 
So, and keep in mind that the driveway that's there now is literally a dirt driveway. Some of you will remember that from the site walk that we had uh, about two years ago. Um, and we'd be happy to have another site walk, obviously, for those of you who don't. But feel free to take a look at that anytime you wish. And we can certainly walk down there and point that out at the time. The point being there is that the impact going into the longer red road would be considerably greater than it would be uh, where we are right now. Um, and again, I'd just like to, to point out that the impact that we've got um, would uh, be only a tier one permit, uh, which is a very a relatively minor permit as far as the DEP is concerned, because we're only looking at less than 10,000 square feet of impact. This is also where we're proposing to impact the wetlands on the Blue Road um, is, uh, is not part of the actual stream. Uh, Red Brook, by the way, is almost a mile off to the left, the actual Red Brook, but they have many, many tributaries in this four to five square mile area of which it's a part. And uh, what we're looking at doing is only impacting the, the basic wetlands, uh, not the stream. There's a small stream that comes out. It's the outlet for those ponds, actually, up by Mr. and Mrs. Chapman's house. And then it cuts straight across uh, where the arc on that red road is. That's the stream. Anything that's below that is just, it's a forested wetland, which basically means it just, uh, when it rains, that's the area that, uh, as a micro watershed, where the rain ends up filtering down to its lowest point. So the, uh, there's no flow in that area whatsoever. Um, so we're not obstructing anything that way. Any of the culverts that we would end up putting into the, uh, the wetland area that is in the blue stream portion of it, or in the blue or road portion of that, um, would be just be hydrostatic relief culverts. It just means that there's free flow of any water, any wetlands that might be in that area. It's not actually going anywhere. It just allows the, uh, um, the bottom of the food chain beasts, as it were, to be able to walk through or crawl through those um, uh, culverts and then uh, obviously alleviate any hydrostatic flow from one side or the other. So it's very neutral in that regard. Bottom line is the impact is exceptionally small. Um, a couple of years ago when we were here, uh, we had a uh, soil scientist, uh, in conjunction with our original work, um, go out actually twice. Once originally did all the wetlands impact. Uh, then the town requested that uh, there be, a, at the uh, uh, client's cost, um, a third-party reviewer for wetlands. So uh, an individual soil scientist from Normando came down and agreed with our findings, or agreed with our soil <coughs> scientist findings. We also had the state soil scientist, uh, who was in the area at the time, actually also come over and take a look at this, and he also agreed with the findings. And the DEP was out there at this time as well. Um, and uh, while this, well, we withdrew that DEP application, um, the DEP had, had tacitly agreed at the point, at that point too, that uh, this was the least amount of impact on the overall project. Uh, the reason we actually withdrew this at the time is that Mr. and Mrs. Chapman were in a situation where uh, it became a lot more conducive for them to be able to put this on the back burner for a while. Um, and then the uh, um, situation righted itself, as it were, and uh, so we're back, uh, and we picked this back up again uh, several months ago, utilizing much of the same engineering design that we were able to utilize before. Um, so we are considerably further along in our designs of what you see here, but for sketch plan or re-sketch plan introduction, basically, we wanted to keep things simple for the people who are on the board who weren't here last time, uh, and rather than crowd uh, this particular uh, site plan with all kinds of interesting engineering information that could be uh, rather difficult to take a look at quickly, we limited it to this area. Uh, we obviously will be back when we come back for preliminary with uh, the, the lengthy plan sets. It's got all the information in it at that point. Jamal brings up quite a number of interesting points that we will absolutely address. Uh, we would expect nothing less, and pursuant to the regulation, we're prepared to, certainly to do that. There are a couple of things, too, in, in uh, Jamal's uh, comments that I would just like to uh, address very, very quickly. I know this is not a voting situation this evening, so I'm not going to go into great detail. Uh, but obviously, as he states, the, uh, there's a limitation to impacts on wetlands. We obviously want to limit that. That's one of the reasons why we put the road where it is, um, so that, again, these overall wetland impacts are less than 9,000 square feet total for everything that we're proposing here. Uh, the future development capacity, we're happy to put in that uh, arced Paper Street, which is kind of a bad word nowadays, but it's a connection to the extent that any future developer might want to use the existing short road to be able to connect um, at the top into the portion of the property that is not yet developed. Uh, Jay suggested that. We have no issues with that. Uh, it's not going to happen from Mr. Chapman's standpoint, and we can restrict it toward that end as far as he's concerned. But after, obviously, he would leave the property, whether it's you know four years or 40 years, then obviously it would be open to, uh, to anybody who might be um, acquiring the property at that point. 
there was a question about uh, layout meeting town standards for medium, medium or, or minimum radius. Uh, we have done that. We'll be happy to take a look at it again, but we did run the radii and, and it appears to work just fine. Um, as far as the, uh, the longer road option, uh, saying it eliminates the need for uh, new wetland and stream crossings, it actually doesn't. Uh, it, it not only is a greater impact for wetlands, particularly where the ponds are concerned, but that road actually comes considerably closer to the stream. We don't go near the stream. Uh, in fact, we stop shy of the buffer to the stream uh, with the short road. So all things considered, that short road is a much less of an impact than the long one. Enough said toward that end. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce uh, Peggy. Uh, McGeehee to be able to come up and just talk a little bit about that alternatives analysis because we want to be able to make sure that the board, if they have any questions, will answer them or address them. And then obviously if you have any comments, uh, we'd like to be able to solicit that input uh, before we leave this evening. Thank you very much. I think I should be about five minutes. I'm Peggy McGeehee with Perkins Thompson. And um, uh, Mr. Chapman, Jay Tetnus, and uh, uh, Jim had asked us to, uh, to do um, the, uh, the alternatives of analysis that um, is required by the conservation subdivision ordinance. And uh, so we uh, assumed no waivers. We took the project. It's actually it's an improved project from uh, 2016. And I wish there was a pointer. Is there a pointer somewhere? No. I, but um, the open space is different um, in the sense that there's not the, a skinny arc at the top, but it now includes part of a pond. So that when you have um, uh, folks uh, going into a conservation subdivision and you, you think about them walking around in the open space, they could go down to the pond here and uh, walk around. So it's an improvement in terms of uh, what the, um, uh, the charm of the place would be uh, for uh, the uh, owners of the uh, six lots. Uh, the, uh, the plan also uh, provides for rain gardens on each on each lot, and that's relevant, particularly when you come to uh, the uh, watershed, the Red Brook watershed uh, guidelines. Uh, so um, there were a couple of different changes, um, and uh, we did do this by the book. We assumed no waivers. We went ahead with the 28 foot wide and the four to one ratio, and uh, as you see in your packet, um, based on that kind of analysis, uh, we found that by every measure, wetland and pervious surface, the short road is better, has reduced impact, less impact than the long road. And we really do, it, it's a very costly, disruptive kind of alternative. I can see why we do that alternative, it's uh, called for, but um, we're hoping that you will agree uh, that uh, this shorter road is the, uh, the way to go uh, from um, every standpoint, uh, including the environmental standpoint. Uh, one of, we did meet with uh, Jay Chase, and he said, uh, don't go by the book. Um, because this board often uh, grants uh, waivers for down to 22 feet and to three one. So we did that. You still have, um, it, it changes the impervious surface. I think we did a quick and dirty here. We had the total impervious surface of the long road under the, by the book standard is 61,000 square feet. And uh, for the short road is 36. But if you reduce the width of the road, and it, the road right now, the little bit that you have it, um, into the property is only about 11 feet wide and it's a dirt road. So um, th that is something to consider when we're talking about uh, what we're doing uh, to, um, uh, to build to at least the, the 22 foot standard. Uh, so if we go to 22 feet and 3 to 1, uh, that only reduces um, uh, the long road impervious surface from 61,000 to 48,000 and short from 36 to 29,000. You still have 9,000 square feet wetland impact in the short road and by reducing those standards you have 13,000 with the long road. So the reason why is because the conservation subdivision ordinance defines wetlands to include these ponds. And so when you include the ponds, which were not included back in 2016, you have to think about the fill that goes into this first pond right here. In the, in the, uh, this one is a, we have a, a more up-to-date uh, version of this plan. And this pond would be filled, have to be filled in 
uh, part way, and, uh, and that uh, is an extensive, it's not only two-dimensional square feet, it's a huge amount of fill because it's 10 feet deep. Uh, so uh, we did the, uh, uh, the reduced version of the road analysis, and we find that uh, the short road st still has a greater environmental impact. And the other impact, which is different, I think, for other, uh, if this project as opposed to other projects you do, is the Red Brook Impaired Stream watershed. It was believed in 2016 that the watershed only went this far. But the, as the watershed district maps and uh, the town's own maps show, the whole property is in the watershed. And what the watershed guidelines say, and I've got them right here, uh, they, they talk about how important it is not to have a lot of impervious surface, that there is a direct connection between how much impervious surface you have and the, uh, how, the impairment of the stream. And so for this project, you're going to want to be thinking about having less impervious surface, not the 20,000 more square feet of impervious surface with the red road, but uh, to have the shorter one, uh, which would be a better option. And I know that the town of Scarborough is the leader in this district uh, in terms of thinking of the guidelines. Uh, the management plan uh, talks about that. And so this is something we know that uh, you all are considering um, in trying to uh, maintain and improve uh, the impaired stream watershed. Um, did want to address uh, may I say Jamal? Uh, Jamal. Jamal, okay. Or Mr. Torres? <laughs> Jamal. Jamal's fine. Okay, nice to meet you. As he says in his comments, he would like us to address um, the future development capacity. Uh, Mr. Chapman has said, Mrs. Chapman is not, this is their Shangri-La. They have their home, they have the wildlife, the, the fish in the ponds. Um, this is not, this is, they plan to have this be uh, their home and just with, um, have the six lot subdivision off to the side. So um, we're sincere in saying that this is not intended to have any kind of a future uh, development. If there were, I, I do know that Jamal was saying that um, in his comments that if the whole property were developed um, by going to the red one now, you would have less impervious surface. We, respectfully, we don't agree uh, because you could with the, the um, and we only met with Jay, we didn't get a chance to meet with Jamel. If you do that little arc of a paper street at the top of the red, uh, loop over, um, then uh, it's shorter. And I think that that's a, a reasonable uh, suggestion um, and that would um, uh, continue for future development to have a reduced um, impervious surface um, alternative. Um, trying to remember if there's any other point that you would like us to address uh, this evening to the board. I think you've, you've done all of um, future development capacity. And certainly board members can draw attention to anything that they feel needs to be okay. further addressed all as right. well. Um, if you just give me a second to look at my notes, I may be all set. Uh, um, I do think there's one other point uh, that uh, we worth mentioning for the board. Uh, as Jim was saying, uh, we have um, wet, some wetland at, um, at the uh, new road entrance with the blue road. There is a live flowing stream at the back where the red road would be. And uh, in order to avoid it, you have to take away uh, the, the best lot from six to five. And, and this is already uh, quite an expensive undertaking um, uh, that um, we, I do not think that in doing an alternatives analysis that uh, the alternative should be uh, looking at a ch different design that you look at the same design of the subdivision and then work on your alternatives to get there. Uh, so in, unless there are no other uh, points uh, to be addressed in the comments, uh, we uh, look forward to your thoughts and um, uh, to a meeting with your staff.
One of the things I'd like to mention that uh, Peggy has mentioned as well is that in comparing the apples to apples scenario, um, we did not uh, count on any waivers toward that end. We are going to be asking the board for one waiver anyway uh, when we do come back for preliminary. Again, it's not a voting situation this evening, and that is for uh, a waiver of the sidewalk. Um, these are six lots on a dead end road in a very rural part of town that doesn't have sidewalks within probably the better part of a mile anywhere. This, uh, given the very few number of lots that you can see, uh, it, we just don't see that it's uh, necessary to be able to have a, uh, a suburban slash urban style sidewalk um, that would go into this area. Other than that, there really, we don't really see any need for any waivers. We're not asking for anything in particular. Uh, again, some of the couple of the members that are here that were here uh, several a couple of years ago uh, will remember that uh, this was a fairly innocuous subdivision when we or development when we first uh, um, brought it forward, and the entire thing really uh, hinged on uh, the wetlands regarding the, the Red Brook. It wasn't even the wetlands per se because the wetland impact is absolutely minimal, but it is in Red Brook, and uh, we're not uh, trying to minimize that. We're obviously minimizing the impact, but we're not trying to minimize saying, "Oh, let's go in the Red Brook anyway just because we want to." That's where this area is. The important part that I'm making toward that end is that this is not actually part of the brook. Everything is in its own micro, every bit of land in the, in the world is in its own micro watershed, if not greater watershed. In this particular area, the, the wetlands that we are impacting at less than uh, 10,000 square feet um, are not connected to the brook or the ponds. They are completely a separate forested wetland area while they are in the watershed there is no connection directly to any stream per se. Given that, what we'd like for this evening is just to uh, solicit any comments or any suggestions that you might have, uh, and then we will beg back to you shortly with the uh, preliminary request for approval. Uh, but uh, again, anybody who's got any particular comments, now is the time. We'd love to be able to hear them, and then we'll address them next time. Great. Thank you. Appreciate the, those overviews. And um, just a reminder, to the board, this is sketch review, so we certainly don't need to get into sort of engineering and designing the thing. Um, but to the extent folks have, you know, general feedback, uh, that's uh, that's what this is for. So, uh, Rachel, do you, would you like to start off? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. I, I noticed in the narrative that um, you've referenced uh, river otters as being present on the property. Yes. Where? In the pond, there's that great pond that's got all kinds of uh, convolutions to it. It's in that, uh, that particular pond. There's a river otter out there. Is right here? Yes. Okay, not the uh, smaller one, although presumably they could find their way there. Right, they're, yeah. they're not totally aquatic, so they could go wherever they want to, but uh, yes. It, uh, Okay. Have, the, have middle you, the middle one has the otters. Okay, have you considered um, what you might be doing in order to protect them, since that's part of the open <clears throat> space? Uh, yes, we just there's no development that's planned for that area whatsoever. It would basically be limited to what's there right now, which is other than the single driveway that goes through that area, that's it. Um, so we wouldn't propose to go into that area at all. But a part of it is open space in proposed in this property, and otters do walk. Yes. <laughs> uh, and this, uh, if I may, um, this should be addressed um, either in uh, uh, restrictions in the deeds or in the association bylaws about uh, uh, being respectful of the uh, wildlife uh, that's on pre present. That's part of you know the, the open space idea where they where a residents can get to the pond is for their enjoyment, but not for their interference. Right. Uh, I, I like that, the way you express that, uh, and I recommend that it be in the deed. Um, you might want to look at uh, basically a study of the wildlife in that area to see what else there is. If, if, if that is an important feature uh, of these lots and of the proposed subdivision, uh, it would be very helpful if you both know what's there and consider how you would be going about in the construction to mitigate any uh, disturbance of the wildlife such as, such as the otters. Uh, I, I understand the concern about um, there's only six, six lots here, but um, I would suggest 
sidewalks. I don't think a school bus is going to get down there, and there are going to be potentially children walking out to New Road. So uh, sidewalks would be helpful. I can't help myself, but to mitigate the impact is to not have the red road be near the ponds at all. I'm addressing the blue road. Pardon? I'm addressing the blue road. Yes, good. Thank you. Uh, and I go back to sidewalks are necessary, I believe, for a development like this because of uh, children going out to the road. Thank you. Thank you. Rick? I think you've got everything you need for a sketch review. You're good. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Good. What do you say? It's good. Yes. Joel, did you have something? I just want to bring the attention to the board that uh, I'm currently using uh, Nazi Civil Solutions for my mother's property. So I just want to make sure there shouldn't be any issue whatsoever, but I just want to bring that attention to the board. Okay. All right. Thank you. Roger? Okay. Uh, I actually think you've made a compelling case for the, um, the blue road, the short road. Um, and especially where uh, Mr. Um, Chapmas and his family intend to just retain that, that property that they currently have their home in. Uh, I, you, know, you might have a revenue source there with audit, <coughs> audits. You know, most people in town don't, I don't think, realize you have audits out there. So, um, But I have, um, I have no other questions at this time. Okay, thank you. Can I chime yes. in? Because I think a lot of these, um, the points we're talking about, the long road and short road in the staff comments, um, I think staff is not weighing one way or the other. I think what we're looking for is an apples to apples comparison, which I don't think has been provided. So I feel like if we keep, if we come back with a preliminary similar, we're going to have the same comments. Um, because we're looking at, I guess, a couple of things. We're talking about crossing near the pond. Um, obviously, when you start talking about wetland impacts with any kind of state permitting, you're talking about alternative analysis, which would not allow you to do a four to one slope. It would be more like a one to one or a wall of sorts. So I think the 15,000 square feet is, is not accurate in that. So there are a couple things like that. Also looking at when we talked about the radius on the long road going up, if you go back to the 2016 plan, which they provided with this road alignment, it actually showed a very um, a larger radius, which showed a more sweeping curve that stayed completely away from the stream. So I, I'm, and I'm not saying the long road is the way to go. I think we just need to see the apples to apples comparison, and I think this is very much skewed and doesn't give us that, or at least staffs comfor not comfortable with the information provided. And I don't feel like that that was really addressed. And <clears throat> what one thing we want to do with our due diligence um, on the alternatives is to do what you expect of us, and uh, apples to apples. And the one thing that I was advising, and if this is not correct, please let me know. First I was advising, go by what the ordinance says, don't assume waivers. But then assume waivers if they're common waivers. But I don't know that the town does a one-to-one. -one. Um, I, the only thing we were told by staff is that the board will grant a uh, waiver to three to one. Uh, we do have DEP issues and Army Corps issues, uh, but we have to, um, as I've advised, is we have to meet the most conservative of each of the agencies. And so we don't want to have a, a one-to-one uh, one -one with you when, when actually you would not approve a one-to-one. -one. Um, so that's uh, where we need your guidance. Um, I feel that when we do an alternatives analysis, it is for the Scarborough ordinance and under its Scarborough definitions and not an alternatives analysis that meets Army Corps. And I think what you're referring to is just general straight linear road, you're going to have a three to one slope off it, which okay. is not what we're looking at here. So I mean, that's just one piece. So I guess, um, um, and then also looking at, as you had mentioned, there's um, an existing 11 foot wide compacted gravel surface, which if you start comparing, comparing total impervious areas, I think you got to account for the fact that the existing site does have impervious area that should be discounted from that long road. So there's a bunch of little factors like that. And so I think it's just needing more information for staff to be able to feel comfortable with that. 
Yeah, it does. I appreciate that, Angela. It's helpful. And I, I think it, it does sound like, um, and, and certainly it sounds like the applicant has been communicating with staff and is open to continuing to work with staff. And it sounds like there's some more homework to do there, kind of offline, so to speak, uh, to get us to the point where where we can really fully weigh, weigh in on that before things advance too much farther. May I ask a question? Uh, uh, sure, Thank absolutely. You. Uh, in looking at alternatives analysis uh, for the Army Corps and the DEP, cost is considered. Is cost a, a consideration when you look at alternatives in Scarborough? In other words, if something is a million dollars with one alternative but only 100000 with another, does that matter to you or is that not considered? Because there is an ex exceptional cost difference, especially with all the fill that it would have to be put in to make the 11 foot, 22 feet uh, right at that bottom pond. I can just chime in. From my experience, I would say this board is more lenient and, has, and factors that in more than the DEP or Army Corps. So cost does matter. Okay. Well, you have an opi the opinion by the board. I mean, that's. that's I think it's act, I think it's fair to say uh, that the board generally tries to you know takes a a big picture view um, and certainly weighs heavily things like the you know the 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 really the the <coughs> fundamental underpinnings of, of of the conservation subdivision in this case. So avoiding wetlands. Um, all those things that you're well familiar with, and um, you know, I, I don't. The board generally won't make determinations based purely on cost, but at the same well, time, I guess the way the, the way I would put it, it, just based on my own personal experience and interpretation of it, is that um, you know, the board the board weighs all of these things and enforces the ordinance, um, but also there is a there is a, a sort of a basic reasonableness. Um, that comes into play, and we don't want to impose undue burdens, particularly when um, when it's recognized that there may be things that are beyond the applicant's control and 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 sort of beyond the a reasonable time horizon. That said, one of the tricky things about this, really the the underlying challenge of this, is that we do as a planning board have to, and, I, and I'll you know I'll quote our. Uh, one of our former member, Susan Oglis, who, who would occasionally remind us that planning board has the word planning in it. And so there are times, a lot of what we do involves just interpreting and, and enforcing ordinances, and basically kind of being umpires in a way. But there is sometimes a planning element of that where we do have to look and think, think ahead. And the fact that in a case like this, even though I think, you know, none of, all of us completely understand that for the foreseeable future, this is sort of a happily ever after kind of scenario. But over time, land changes hands, and some future board could be sitting here decades from now with someone wanting to develop a remaining pocket of buildable upland land there. And so I think it's, you know, I, I do agree with staff that it's appropriate to, to factor that in, whether, whether we end up feeling like we prefer the long road over the short road is a, is a separate question, but I think it's fair to, to have on the table. So, Nick, do you have anything? Uh, <clears throat> I have a question regarding the recommendation about a 75-foot buffer to the tributary streams. Would that, if the board were to seek that type of restriction or setback, would that basically remove the road from even being an option? And what's, where's the, it's, a, it's under number. Under your subdivision elements, and it's your third board. It should be out of that 2011 Red Brook Watershed Management Plan recommends a 75 foot buffer to tributary streams to Red Brook. While the buffer hasn't been established as an ordinance at this point, staff recommends the board consider requiring such suitable buffers to the tributary streams on the site as a similar measure to protect and maintain the health of the watershed. Are you considering the tributary stream sort of in that curve? That's kind of my question. Curve area, <laughs> yeah. But, but which was, you know, where, where is that delineation? I think we'd like to see that on the plans. Um, since the manage, management plan does recommend it, mm -hmm. that needs to be established, and that's for the board to weigh in on when the designs are provided. Um, it's not ordinance, but it's certainly something that staff takes very seriously. 
Do you have anything else to add, Angela? Um, yeah. Okay. I think you can. <laughs> Make sure I go. Yeah. So, I mean, for, for what it's worth, um, uh, it sounds like staff needs some more information, but I'm not generally opposed to the shorter road here. Um, but I think any more information would be helpful. I do not believe you need sidewalks in a subdivision of this size. And additionally, if you're worried about the watershed, I'm not sure adding more impervious surfaces is a great idea either in this specific location. So um, that's my two cents, and I think that's about it for the sketch level stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Dick. Yeah, and I don't have much to add uh, beyond what I what I said a couple <coughs> minutes ago. Um, it, it does sound like there, there's some more homework to do to get us to a, kind of an apples to apples comparison and um, I, as, as with Nick, I'm not necessarily opposed to the shorter road. I just think it would uh, be helpful to have the full, have the full background and the, and the, the data there. Um, I'll, uh, I'll stick to form uh, for myself and, and say that I, I would still like to see the, side, the sidewalks. I understand the concern about impervious surface, but um, I think Again, I, I think it's. It, I think sometimes people think of sidewalks as something that connects to other neighborhoods. Um, I think it's you know it's it's in there for a reason, and it's really for the safety and convenience of the of the residents. Um, you know, we'll see where we where the board goes on that going forward. But that's that's where I stand. So uh, and I think we've provided absolutely provided the feedback you're looking for, and um, you can work with staff and. Come back to us when you're ready. Corey, I do have one question. Yes. Uh, as far as a uh, site walk is concerned, I uh, may be presumptuous, but I presume that you would want it, the board would want a site walk. Maybe not. Um, some members have already been out there. Mm -hmm. The point being is that uh, in about three weeks, daylight savings time ends, right. and it's going to get a little challenging. Right. Um, if we want a site walk, is it possible to do it before that time? Okay. I think that's something we can we can work out with staff, um, and we can. We can talk about that um, as a board uh, separately, but I, I think um, given the turnover on the board and, and some of the things that have, some of the circumstances that have changed, uh, that, may be, that may be useful, and, and that is a good point about the, the limited daylight that's coming up. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll coordinate with, with staff, and staff can coordinate with you to the extent that we Great. go ahead to plan something like that. Cool. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 11, ENF Limited Liability Company requests a final site plan amendment for 371 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's <laughs> Map, U39, Lot 4709. Jamel? Thank you. So, uh, Land Rover is back before the board uh, for a contract zone amendment to include lot U39, lot 4709 to enable the addition of 89 parking spaces to be used for new inventory. Uh, this property is located in a contract zone uh, in the B3 zoning district and the new property that the parking lot is proposed on is actually in the Highgate Parkway uh, zoning district. So a little bit of background, uh, the applicant received preliminary provisional site plan approval from the board in August. Uh, the applicant has incorporated uh, many of the board's comments um, and is here tonight for final site plan approval. Staff would also like to note that the town council approved the contract zone amendment in, uh, on October 3rd. And uh, one quick comment, as requested by the board, the applicant expanded the proposed limited disturbance buffer to include a minimum 50-foot offset to the stream in all areas, uh, sort of follows the natural alignment of the brook or the stream. So the applicant should be to discuss this with the board tonight just to sort of add, talk about those additions to the buffer. And at this time, staff has no further comments. Thanks, Jamel. And I'll hand it off to the applicant's team. Uh, thank you, Scarborough. It's good to be back. I can report that in the third inning, the Red Sox are up 1-0 over the Yankees. And uh, I'm here tonight for uh, e &F, minutes. Uh, <laughs> Land Rover. Um, and I believe we've done everything that you've asked and staff has asked. I think that's reflected in Jamel's memo in the peer review engineer memo. And as uh, Jamel has requested, um, 
I'd just like to read two paragraphs that were inserted into the contract language at the planning board's request. And you know those documents have a lot of whereas, so forgive me. It says, whereas ENF has agreed to provide a permanent undisturbed buffer <coughs> in the vicinity of Willowdale Brook, generally 100 feet in width, and in all cases, a minimum of 50 feet from the brook to remain in its natural state in perpetuity as depicted on the approved final site plan. And that's depicted in the graphic there, the yellow areas in yellow and green. And secondly, the second paragraph that was added was, whereas ENF shall comply with the provisions set forth in Chapter 419, Post-Construction Stormwater Infrastructure Management Ordinance. Uh, so we've, we've incorporated your uh, request into the contract, which has been approved and recorded in the registry now. And um, I'm hopeful that tonight that you can grant final site plan approval. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so again, this has been in front of us a few times, and it does appear that the applicant's been pretty responsive. Does anyone have any questions or comments this time? Rachel? Yes, I, I looked through here for the um, for the visual on that mysterious shed that I've asked about a couple of times. Did you provide? Uh, we did not. So if you'd like to impose a condition, that, I, I don't know what it would be, but um, you certainly could deal with it. No, it's just that uh, that's you know I'm I'm fine with it, but I did ask several times for that. I'm assuming it's a regular storage shed. Somebody will correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. It is. It's nothing but, uh, unusual. It, it is a traveling shed that apparently is traveling uh, from parking area to parking area and constantly showing Hopefully up on the plans. Place. Yeah. Well, as I said, I, I did request that, but I'll 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 um, I'll not hold you to task on it. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Rick, did you have anything? No. Um, Go shed that. Right. <laughs> All right. Be nice to see what it looks like. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have anything to add. Um, pretty straightforward, and I, I appreciate that. You know, I know there's some back and forth on the parking and the previous surface, and I think we ended up at a pretty good place here. So, um, with that, I will move to approve the project titled Land Rover Jaguar, proposed by ENF LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics dated August 31st, 2018, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings as stated, one waiver is that uh, to permit the parking aisle widths as depicted on the plan set dated August 31st, 2018. Conditions, number one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall execute and record the maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater management ordinance. And number two, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. Second. A dueling seconds here. We'll give it to Roger. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item number 12, Carriage Walk Apartments requests a subdivision and site plan review for lot one of the Crossroads Plan Development District, phase one, assessor's map R52, lot four. Well, Thank you sure for this. Mr. Chair, uh, so just a quick background on this project. Uh, the applicant received preliminary subdivision approval for lot one in August. Uh, the applicant is in front of the board tonight with a final subdivision and site plan for lot one of the phase one plan development on the Crossroads uh, property. So the applicant is proposing to build four 12 unit apart apartment buildings on the site. As the board may recall, the applicant, or the applicant has provided additional information about the proposed building design and architecture with this submission. As some board may, members had questions related to the architecture, staff encourages the board to review and consider the proposed design as guided by the architecture section and the design standards. In particular, contemporary siding materials such as vinyl are permitted. However, the applicant should provide details on the quality of the proposed vinyl siding. 
The standard seeks to ensure materials are of a quality that will have long-term uh, viability. And other comment is that the applicant should be sure to discuss the status of their main DEP permit uh, with the board tonight. That's all I have. Thank you. And uh, turn it back to Mr. Bacon. Uh, thank you very much, and good evening again. Uh, Dan Bacon with Laurel Palmer. I'm here with Rocky Rivera of m &R Holdings and other members of his team. And as Jamal introduced, uh, this is lot one in the phase one of the Downs project. Um, in addition to the preliminary approval that you provided earlier, uh, I guess it was late summer, in August, also at your last meeting, you provided final subdivision approval for the overall subdivision that makes up this first phase of the project. So we're coming back to you with approval for this lot, which is within that overall uh, subdivision approval that you provided. And we'll be coming back to you for lot two at a, a subsequent meeting. This is the lot that um, is the rental apartment lot um, with 48 units. Um, and it's going to be a combination of single uh, one-bedroom units and two-bedroom units. And um, I know you've seen it many times before. So I'm going to uh, be brief in the presentation and kind of get to the, to the comments that, that Jamel provided and some uh, the final issues that you've been reviewing. Uh, in terms of staff comments, um, there was uh, the note in question about affordable housing. So this, unlike any other zone um, in town, there's a requirement for affordable housing of 10%. So uh, lot one will be providing six units of the overall required affordable units within the, this phase of the project. Um, and it'll meet the town's requirements for rental affordable units and you have a program in place. Um, staff had some questions around sort of public and private walkways and access uh, through this lot and to this lot. So the plan for lot one is to have a combination of both public pedestrian ways or sidewalks and also some private ways. Um, so as part of the overall subdivision approval you provided at the last meeting, there's going to uh, be sidewalks along the Downs Road. There's going to be sidewalks that um, go along Grist Mill Lane to provide access along Lot 1 into the single-family neighborhood. So those will provide for pedestrian movement along and across Lot 1. There's also going to be planned private walkways that really provide connections from those sidewalks into the individual buildings and units. So we wanted to be kind of clear about um, where there'll be access for the general public and also um, simply for residents of this, of this uh, apartment complex. Signage we're working on right now with a landscape architect, so we uh, respectfully request the ability to, to work with staff on the design of signage. We want it to match with the, um, the architectural and uh, theme of the project in, in terms of materials and design. Um, so uh, we will have that soon, and, and, can, and it will comply with zoning, and we can bring it back to staff if, if that's allowable through the board. Um, there was another question about utility stubs um, to a portion of Lot 1 that's not proposed for development at this point. Um, there is an area on the southern end of Lot 1. It's, you can see it easier on the plan down below. There's a sort of a, a green space. Um, on the southern end of, of the lot towards um, lot two. And we're providing stubs there because there is development potential there. It's not planned at this point, um, but this zone allows, uh, frankly, a lot more density than is being proposed in phase one right now. Uh, and we see the opportunity for um, an additional apartment building or um, a building with a certain number of units that will come back to the board through site plan review amendment at, at a future time. Uh, at this point, we weren't proposing development, but we wanted to ensure the utilities could connect to it. Um, I think other than that, architecture was talked about a fair amount at our last meeting on this site. Um, the, the team has looked kind of closely at the architecture, and we've provided in your submission an explanation. I think it was a, a fairly in-depth explanation around how we believe the design of these buildings meets uh, the town's commercial design standards and is, is really a balance in terms of meeting all the zoning goals for, uh, for this project and for this phase. Um, like I said, there's no other zone in town that requires affordable units. Um, and 
Uh, I know that Rocky and his team know um, how to build these units, know what they cost, know that they're going to rent successfully um, for more moderate income housing and, and also be able to uh, provide for those six units of affordable housing. Um, so uh, this is a, a product they know and, and they want to deliver for this site and they've tried to customize it uh, uniquely to this project and it's designed to be compatible with the other units um, in the other aspects of the project um, in, in lot two and to match the architecture but also have its its own uh, flair and its own uh, uniqueness on this site. So um, we've looked at that and, and feel that it complies and we can talk to the board further about that. Uh, in terms of the vinyl siding, I'm not an expert on vinyl siding but I know some people that are and um, their intention is to to use very high quality vinyl siding. I'm sure Rocky can kind of get into the details of that if you'd like. And it was raised in staff comments. Um, and before he does, I just want to mention in terms of uh, other agency approvals, uh, we did receive the DEP permit actually today um, for this lot, but also uh, lot two and other aspects of this phase. Uh, we received the sanitary district approval, so sewer approval in the, in the recent weeks, as well as the Portland Water District approval. So. We have all the requisite approvals to be able to move forward with, with development on this lot um, at the other, other agencies. So I think with that, I'll either turn it to Rocky or back to the board. Thanks. Uh, I'm happy to address the, the type of vinyl siding that, that we're proposing to use. Uh, uh, exactly the same uh, vinyl siding that we've used over at Carrier Woods. Uh, it's a certain teed product. Uh, it's their top of the line, the monogram line. Uh, it's, it's the same product we use on all the uh, high-end housing that we do. It's actually on a house that I put under contract in Scarborough today uh, for $640,000. So it's a high-quality vinyl siding. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, success with it, and that's our intention to, to use on this. All right. Thanks. Did you have anything else before we... No, I'm all set. Okay, Thanks. great. I'll be Thank here you. for questions. Great. Anyone want to start us off? Yeah. Me? Real quick. Um, just a, the, you have the package, the 10 by 10 package in the mailboxes over there. Is there any reason you didn't kind of extend that sidewalk to kind of connect from, you know, walkability wise from the units over to where they're, I assume that's where they're getting their mail. Is that correct? The uh, mailboxes are. Yeah, you have one that's a package, uh, 10 by 10 package. Package building, yes. yeah, Amazon building we're calling it, and then there's a mailbox, uh, a gang mailbox installation. And there's a sidewalk that's not, that's actually already been approved along Grist Mill Lane that runs right in front of it. So there is a sidewalk connection to those, to that, to those mailboxes in that building. Now the natural human pattern of the straight line creates the path through the grass. You know, going right. I mean, I could just see anyone in the building A. You know, I don't know if they're going to go out and around or building B. You know, or are they just going to make a B line right there? Right. You know, I just question. You know, is it worthwhile to extend that sidewalk to those that little area? It could be what we were envisioning there is more of a, a lawn area for outdoor play. That's the primary kind of green for our residents. And we felt like there was a lot of sidewalk on the, the plan already. I agree that I think people are going to walk across there if they're <coughs> headed back to the units. Um, so, I mean, we can look at that. Uh, but I was thinking of having just a, a green area if that doesn't have another, um, you know, impervious area. But. Okay. Um, I think that was pretty much the extent of it. Um, after looking through everything else. Okay. Thanks. Roger? Um, yes, I, um, I'm fine with uh, just about everything, but I do have a question uh, for clarification on the architecture. All right. Um, and I think I know what the answer is, but I just want to make sure. On, on lot one, on this page here, which is, you know, this one here? Shows yep. it, yeah, that one there. Okay. Um, and I'm looking on uh, A2. Dot oh one. And I just wanted to make sure that the
the front of the building is not just all plain across, but there's reveals, there's, there's depth there? Okay. I, I couldn't... Yeah, the, the entrance to the building and the three windows in the core of the building, in the center of the building, project out. I okay. It's a, at least a foot. And then the no peak overhangs out. Two feet. And the peak overhangs out a bit more. Correct. Okay. Um, that's, that's pretty much how Carrier Woods is, I believe. Okay. I'm all set. Good. Thanks. That's good. Uh, Rachel? Sure. Um, I do agree with Nick that uh, people will take the shortest direction mm -hmm. in order to get their mail, and they will walk down the sidewalk in between uh, C and D and just keep walking down the lawn. Uh, and you might take an opportunity to make that, uh, treat that area as more of a placemaking area. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing is certainly when the, the weather is good, I've, I've had experience of the, um, the package places, the package sheds and the mailboxes as being the gossip time uh, where folks want to hang around and talk. Yep. Uh, and looking at that place as an opportunity to create uh, play, looking at that area as an opportunity to create a place for, for people to meet um, and to save the grass because you're going to need to do that. Um, that might be something you want to consider. Uh, I, another question that I had you actually answered and that was on that fifth building that uh, we saw at the uh, uh, way back when this first came up and saw a fifth apartment building as a potential Mm -hmm. in the future potential. So um, it's good that you brought us back to it. I, I was sure. wondering where that had, where that had gone. I, I think in terms of the signs as you are developing those, one question I would have, and I know we had a discussion about it um, with the uh, Gateway Commons, and that is how are the buildings themselves going to be identified? In other words, if building A, where is the A going to go, if that's what you're, you're looking at? And, and thus far, in none of these plans do we see right. how the buildings are labeled. Um, right. We're going to coordinate with the police department on, on that specifically in terms of addressing. Um, okay. And I know they have but I, I'm also talking about in terms of style. Okay. I, so, so that the style of the address kind of matches the sign? Oh, in terms uh, of, yeah, the signage matching yeah. the building signage with the... Um, the freestanding signage. Yeah, that there be that there be a connection gotcha. to those. Uh, and then um, another question I had in terms of placemaking, is it the intent that the area, uh, the open space area and trail work, uh, trail area around the, um, the individual houses where there's a children's play area that whole center around the single-family houses. Yeah, there's is that be... is that going to be basically the the uh, place making and available to? That's going to be available to others beyond the single-family neighborhood. Okay, and that was brought up at the last through the subdivision review um, for the single-family neighborhood in the Downs Road, and we've been working with staff on adding language in the uh, declaration around access to that. Okay. Yep. Uh, and where does that trail come out? I don't, I, I don't have the, so the area you're thinking about is up in here. Right. And there's trails that come in from the four sides. So there's going to be a trail connection here. Uh, is it is that coordinated is within with your uh, and it's across from, cross from it's across cross from box. that green space in the mailboxes we were just discussing and then there's going to be three other points of access from the single family neighborhood is there going to be a crosswalk then leading there's across to specifically to connect to that trail <clears throat> yes there's a crosswalk planned here because there's on street parking we can't have a crosswalk okay. right mid-block, so it's been planned to be at this intersection, and there's a sidewalk that will connect the trail to these crosswalks. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of children getting excited and, you know, running to get to the 
the play area, so I want to make sure that there's that safety. Uh, and finally, um, lest you think I've forgotten the architecture, uh, let me just uh, express my thoughts on this. And, and that is the condos, both the uh, duplexes and the condo buildings have a much smaller bulk and scale than these three-story apartment buildings. And on those, you added uh, a gray uh, shingle sort of effect. And I was thinking about it last time we were here. Uh, Rocky said, um, well, give us an idea. And I didn't have one. Um, so waking up about 2 o'clock in the morning after that, I did have a, a suggestion that I would appreciate you taking another look at. And that is something along the line of some gray features. Uh, it could be, um, the, could be the recessed area of the door. It could be the gable on top, but something that ties these buildings to the condos that come before it, and something that softens the effect of the bulk of these buildings. Uh, and I urge you to do that. I think you have, um, I, I think I'm pleased in general with the development mm -hmm. that's coming forward as the first thing people see. But I'm hoping that you tweak it even a little more so that the whole row along the Scarborough Downs Road, all of those houses people look at and say, I want to stop here, I want to live here. That there is something about it that goes beyond what they can see elsewhere. And it doesn't have to be expensive. Mm -hmm. It takes a little bit of thought. I think something that softens the bulk, softens the starkness, and relates those buildings to the other condos would be much appreciated and I would think would add something extra and very welcome to this development. Thank you. Thanks. Rick? I'm lost. Um, just a couple things actually. One is um, on stormwater, comment seven, that was um, I'm just going to look over to Angela. I, I know stormwater is a challenge out there. The whole, whole site's a challenge, but the stormwater is particularly challenging. So, um, Angela, are, are you comfortable with the way it's being phased in? It looks like it's pretty. St I guess what, what's the specific comment? Number yeah. seven on oh, um, these. Oh, I'll look on this one. I'll look at that. Well, our responses? Yeah. <laughs> I just know stormwater is a challenge out there, and you guys are doing it, you know, as you develop, put the development in. So I didn't know if. Uh, well, right. So it was more about what comes first, because um, you have the development behind you, um, which the planning board already approved, um, the single family house lot, the, the subdivision behind right. you. Chris right. Chris Lane. Chris Lane. Yeah. Um, that storm drain infrastructure actually ties into this stormwater infrastructure. So it was what comes first um, was a concern in making sure we know which is which. And I guess it's a matter of how you guys um, determined, I guess in the MOU, which I know you've supplied, which I haven't looked at yet, um, was who's responsible for what. Right. And when you start getting, it gets a little muddled because it kind of, goes between the two projects. And if it's all one entity, then that's easy and simple. But yep. if it's two, it's not. Right, so we're in the process of developing our phasing plan with uh, m and Holdings uh, team. And it's my understanding the intention is to be, to really be building the road infrastructure and that, I mean, obviously the stormwater in unison. And, and these projects are they're separate projects, but they're going to be happening concurrently. The details of which we're going to have a phasing plan into you before a pre-construction meeting to figure all those things out. Um, in terms of the MOU, the intention is similar to other stormwater uh, facilities in town is that uh, 
the public works maintain the culverts and what's the infrastructure in the street, and then um, the LID systems, so the, the landscaping and the treatment areas and, and things that are outside the right of way would be the responsibility of uh, the homeowner association. So, but we can get into those details with staff to okay. make sure they're happy. Yeah. And so I just want to make sure she was happy. Yep. Because I, the last one I had the long road, short, short road, and I thought you were happy, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last thing, oh, the other thing is just a comment, really. Um, <clears throat> it's got, uh, I'm all set with everything else you guys are doing is um, on the lighting that you're doing, th these are great lights. Um, there's a bunch of manufacturers that make great lights. Um, I would suggest you, it, it, just a thought, mm -hmm. I'd leverage, uh, swing, I would leverage your um, lighting rep mm -hmm. where you're getting these lightings to do the programming for you too and do some really cool programming out there. So um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that they could do out in Falmouth. And you can, um, obviously you can dim them, you know, so people can get better sleep, but you can have the sensors that are on these site sync ones will actually see if there's people or cars there. So for a safety thing, you know, you have them dim at 7.30, and that's what a lot of people do. They just have them dim at 7.30. But, you know, it should be just like a security light and that if someone goes out to their car at midnight because they forgot something, you know, have all the lights come on bright. And, yeah, you might wake some people up, but at least it's a safety thing. Maybe you have them come up to three-quarters of the brightness unless they're running. You can actually do that. So if they're moving really fast, you can have all the lights come on. If they're moving really, really fast, you can have all the lights blink. You know, there's all kinds of neat, cool stuff you can do like that. So, they, so yeah, I mean, once all the lights start blinking, whoever's doing something bad is going to run away. I mean, I will. And there's all kinds of neat stuff you can do with the sensors like that. And I just throw that out there because I'd like to see someone do it. If you need some help, call me. No. <laughs> I don't want to, I just want to see someone do it. But um, they've done it on a couple colleges, college, I've seen it on a couple college campuses down in Boston. They do the running thing. So if someone's running, all the lights, kids love it. Place looks like Christmas all the time. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's a couple other things you can do. With them, but I like the sure. dimming, and then coming on bright if someone walks out there. And then you can dim them in the road, and if a car goes down the road, they can get brighter as the car goes down the road. That's all. Sorry, I'm a little bit off on a tangent there. Oh, for sure. I like to see the Sounds exciting. Yeah. It's, oh, it's very exciting. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so I, I really don't have much to add beyond what's already been said or asked. Um, I, think, I think this looks great overall. Um, in terms of the architecture, um, I think you know, each, of us, each of us may have our own you know, personal thoughts on different things. I mean, I, you know, I, I might not necessarily want to see all white, but I think, I think you've made a good case for for being in compliance with this with the uh, with the standards and um, you know to the extent that you can give consideration to some of the good suggestions that others have had here whether it's um, you know accents on buildings or you know lighting programming or um, you know the whether you whether you have a sidewalk that leads across the grass or not mm -hmm. I mean I I think what what is the planning term for that? A desire path, that's right. and people yes. kind of beat their own path across the grass. I mean, to me, that's something that sort of falls to the level of, you know, that's that's your your property to to figure out, and um, you know, certainly take those take those thoughts to heart. But I don't think they necessarily rise to the level of something that we need to 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 require at this point. Um, just want to make sure I've. Sort of covered everything. Talked about sequence of work and signage, and um, glad to hear you got your DP permit. Um, so yeah, I think we've I think we've covered all the bases here, and uh, we do, we do have a, a motion here that I'd like to go ahead and put forward. Um, I move to approve the project titled Scarborough Downs, Planned Development Lot One, proposed by Carriage Walk Apartments LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Girl Palmer, dated September 24th, 2018, with the following findings and conditions. Findings as stated. Conditions number one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan, sh plan set shall be re revised to include A, the limit of work for the proposed project in relation to the overall subdivision for the phase one development. 1B, a plan note or other legal instrument demonstrating that the public may access the pedestrian infrastructure within the development. 
1C, the location of the lighting fixtures on the utility and landscape plan. 1D, an existing conditions plan that includes the lots as approved for the overall subdivision plan for the phase one plan development. This shall all be re reviewed and approved by the planning department. Condition number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the affordable housing covenants shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall provide a memorandum of understanding which includes language indicating that the future maintenance and operation of the stormwater BMPs is to remain the responsibility of the applicant or the homeowners association for the overall phase one development. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number four, prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall submit a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Number five, Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay a recreation contribution fee in the amount of $500 per unit. <clears throat> Number six, prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall survey foundation locations and other structural elements that are proposed to be in close proximity of the right of way. And number seven, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That's the motion. Second. 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 We have a second from Nick. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as noted earlier, item number 13 was tabled at the request of the applicant. I do want to make a quick housekeeping note here. It's almost 10 past 10. Um, we cannot take up any new items after 1030. We'll see where we stand. Um, if we are not able to get to the last item, it will be the first one on the list for the next meeting. Um, but with that, we'll jump right into it. Item number 14, Roger Hale requested a preliminary subdivision review for 263 Broad Turn Road, Assessor's Map. R8, Lot 13. <coughs> Jamel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project, this proposed project, is located in the RF Zoning District. Um, as the board may recall, the applicant was in front of the board in August for a sketch plan review. Uh, several members of the board also conducted a site walk on the property in late August. Uh, tonight, the applicant is before the board for a preliminary subdivision plan. Uh, for a nine lot residential conservation subdivision, including a 635 foot paved private way. Um, as required by the zoning ordinance, the applicant has provided a conventional subdivision plan uh, with the plan set. Uh, given this site will be served by on site well and wastewater disposal, the lots in the conventional plan shall each have at least 20,000 square feet of contiguous uplands, so the applicant should be sure to discuss this with the board. In accordance with the zoning ordinance, in order for an open space area to be counted towards the 50% requirement, an open space area must include a minimum wetland buffer of 25 feet from the upland edge of a wetland to any building lot property. It appears that the rear boundary, or boundary of lots 1 and 2 do not meet the standard. The applicant should address that. With the steep slopes identified on the site and stabilization of the disturbed area as well as erosion and sediment control is very important here. The applicant should be sure to discuss how they plan to stabilize the steep slopes on the site. Uh, the applicant has not provided a sidewalk on the plans. Uh, staff does encourage the applicant to provide one along the proposed road for, to promote walkability in the proposed development. In accordance with the extractive industry and re land reclamation ordinance, all surface areas affected by previous excavation activity shall be graded and slopes shall not be steeper than four than a four to one slope, which is four feet horizontal to one feet one foot vertical. It appears the applicant is proposing a slope of two and a half to one throughout the subdivision, and staff encourages the applicant to revise the plans and meet the required standard. And that's what I have tonight. Thanks, Jamel. Mm -hmm. And okay. I will turn it over to the applicant's representative. Yeah, good evening. My name's Jason Haskell with the Enroma Consulting Engineers. Uh, helping Roger Hale out on his uh, proposed subdivision at uh, 263 Broad Turn Road. Uh, as uh, we previously uh, discussed, it's a 23 and a half acre parcel um, within the RF zone, and it's currently being utilized as a sand pit. Um, the proposed nine lots have been designed to the conservation subdivision uh, regulations, and it's actually required because of the amount of wetlands on the property. 
um, uh, the ordinance does require that the that fifty percent of the property's area uh, acreage is set into open space. We're actually providing sixty-two percent of the property. Um, we do understand and agree that the lot lines will need to be adjusted to remove the wetlands from lots one and part of two, including the 25-foot buffer. Uh, access and frontage will be from the 635-foot uh, private road, um, consisting of the 24 feet of pavement and two-foot grass shoulders. We have omitted the sidewalk due to the adequate width of the pavement out there and um, the low, low volume of traffic out on the uh, property. Um, if the board would entertain the waiver, um, the grass shoulders could be replaced with gravel or we provide a, uh, a wider pave section or vice versa, either one of those two. Um, really what, what it comes down to is the, including the curb on the sidewalk along the edge is gonna be a little problematic with how flat the slopes are, that the profile grade is at the end of the roadway, that there's potential for there to be ponding even if we did keep the half, the, the meet the town standards for uh, the road profile. Um, just trying to get the water off the, off the road as quickly as we can and with the flatter slopes it would be difficult. And not to mention that it's at the bottom of a gravel or a sand pit, so it's flat to begin with. So just some things that we need to work out if that is the case and we need to include the uh, sidewalks. Uh, the on-site, uh, the, the utilities on the property will be on-site septic systems, which two passing test pits have been included on each lot, uh, private wells and underground with telephone and cable. Uh, the, the project will require both the post-construction stormwater infrastructure, infrastructure management ordinance approval and of the main DEP under stormwater, so it will require both the quality and quantity control, which will be uh, provided. By an infiltration basin located here. Uh, outside of the 75 foot setback from the wetland special significance and the stream. Uh, I know during the site walk uh, there was concerns with erosion on the, the pit walls. Uh, the slopes were designed on this plan with two and a half to one which is the, the requirement of the DEP reclamation but uh, and I was unaware of the the town's more restrictive four to one slopes. Um, these will actually we will go through and regrade this so that it actually probably be a better, obviously a better situation erosion control wise, and will be uh, revised in the uh, updated plans. The, as I said before, the D, we will be required to submit a DEP permit for the stormwater, and we actually had our pre-submission meeting today, which Angela joined me, and we'll be planning to submit by the end of the week, if not Monday. Uh, the plan is not to impact anything within 75 feet of the stream and the upland edge of the wetland of special significance, which is the wetlands within 25 feet of the stream. Um, there's actually no proposed wetland impact associated with this project. Uh, there's adequate site distance in both directions, and the traffic impact fee will be calculated prior to the final submission. We have been in coordination with Maine Historic Preservation Commission Based, and we did receive a response letter from them, and based on the predictive model of prehistoric archaeological site location in southern Maine, this parcel has a probability of the presence of prehistoric archaeological site prior to the excavation of the borrow pit. A phase one prehistoric <laughs> study is recommended in the locations outside of the sand pit. Uh, we did uh, follow up with Maine Historic on this and just to kind of clarify on what they're looking for, what the extents are and what ended up happening was I did not provide them with a grading plan showing the extents of it. Um, they said that they would recommend me sending in a, the grading plan showing the extents of outside of the, the current pit 
and she was under the impression that it may be okay because we won't be getting anywhere it's down near the stream in this location. So it may end up not being a problem, but we'll keep you posted as we hear more from Maine Historic. Um, just uh, follow up on some of the review comments. Um, there's going to be some notes added to the plan. Uh, we have coordinated with uh, Jamel on the abutting open space connectivity, and he does agree that what we are proposing is uh, kind of addressing his is acceptable to uh, the town's uh, outlook. Um, uh, there was also a comment uh, on the reducing the lot sizes. Um, since the sketch plan, we've actually reduced each lot by an average of about 10,000 square feet, resulting in additional open space exceeding what's required under the conservation ordinance. Uh, we also want to be able to provide the, the builder or future lot owner the ability to, to site a septic field, a well, and the house on the property, um, <coughs> meeting all the required setbacks. Um, so we were hoping that we keep the layout the way it is, except for adjusting lots one and two uh, to remove the wetlands and the wetland buffers from the lots. Uh, we have no objection to the street light at the entrance um, if, the, if the board finds a requirement, along with the street trees um, was also included in the comments. And if the board does find this as a requirement, uh, what kind of spacing would you be looking for? Would it be uh, two per lot or anything, just more of a guidance, if you will, going forward with that. Uh, we will also coordinate with the police and the fire department prior to the uh, next submission. Uh, we, as Jamel said, we're here for preliminary approval and can answer any of the questions you may still have. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm guessing there's no public comment on this, but, oh, okay. Oops. I was wrong. Yes. <laughs> Uh, if, you, if you'd yeah. like, come on up, um, introduce yourself, give your name and address, and uh, just try to keep it to five minutes. Yeah. No. Great, thank you. I just have a mostly a quick question, I, and maybe uh, Kathleen Miller, Stephen Burt, we're at 277 Broad Turn Road, um, and our main concern and question is around um, water usage and how much the town is considering um, aquifer, the, the viability of the aquifer as development continues, especially in rural zones where, you know, we're practicing agriculture, and that is a specific concern of ours as people who are using the well, um, and we're all pretty close together. So that's, that's my main question. Okay. So more of a planning. Great. Thank you. And then the follow-up to that is, uh, what, what impact does the planning board, board consider on, on septic systems and drainage from the septic systems into the aquifer, not the aquifer, but the uh, Carter Brook behind the, um, the de development? Okay. So those are the two questions we have, and we don't know the answer to those, how much you consider those elements in your approval. Sure. And not, not even questioning this particular development, but future development. Would you mind giving your name just for the for the record? Uh, Stephen Burt, B U R T. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we did look at the sand and aquifer. If you're looking at potential, if you're looking at contaminants of the aquifer, it's not within a significant aquifer, a sand and gravel aquifer. Based on the the, uh, the main. Yeah, this is this is not within an aquifer overlay. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. Okay. Um, what the about the septics can potentially contaminating everything for the most part seems to drain towards the center of the property, away from the stream. <coughs> And I'll just add. But, yeah. I'll just add too for the you know for the benefit of of the, the public that there you know there is a process. This is preliminary subdivision review. Um, when we get to the point where we're we're talking about site site plan review, there is a whole protocol for 
for looking at um, you know erosion control and stormwater treatment and, and all those things. And uh, in some cases, there are you know there are borings done, and there's a there is a whole um, there is a whole process for that 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 aims to to address those things. And in the case where and this this is not a not one of those cases, but if there is an aquifer overlay, which we do have in some areas of, of the western part of town, then there there are some special uh, requirements that that go along with that. But it is the short answer is it is. Those are things that the town and the towning board that, and, the, and the planning board does factor in. Um, so with that, and we appreciate the, the input and thank you for waiting. <laughs> um, we can turn to board discussion again. It's just preliminary subdivision review. Um, anyone want to go first? Just put it up for grabs. Anyone have any questions or comments? Rachel? Yeah. I. I I guess my, my comment is uh, I did the site review, I did the site walk, and um, those banks are scary. Uh, and I'm going to be looking with a great deal of interest, you know, how you're going to be handling that because uh, as the open, as part of the open space, there are going to be children playing there. Uh, and it, I really, really want to see good stabilization uh, we saw when we did the site walk, we saw mature trees already falling over and down into the sand pit area. Uh, and it's uh, it's of a great deal of concern how that grading is done. Yeah, it, we're definitely going to be, if we're going to meet the, the town's extractive ordinance, then cutting those back to four to one is going to be a significant difference from what is out there right now. I, I agree that it's definitely going to be very important on this project. The other thing, um, as I noted, as I looked at, at the, uh, during the site walk, there are only really two of the lots, I think one in nine, that are forested or have, have woodlands. And um, that leaves this area and s subdivision as uh, really having a potential for some very careful solar passive solar siting and the um, the standards do call for paying attention to uh, that sort of development where where the opportunity arises uh, and I think I think this is a so many of the conservation subdivisions that we see are heavily forested this uh, has a great deal of open space and um, siting these houses so that they take advantage of either solar panels or uh, passive solar uh, development, I think would be a very interesting thing and in line with uh, where conservation subdivisions uh, tend to go if they can, and that is to really be ecologically efficient. Now, is that a typically a requirement of the subdivision approval is to site it is the not house, the house exact. Is that can can that be something that we inform some type of a, a note on the plan to encourage it? Um, that would be that would be something that you certainly could do. Uh, the town encourages uh, paying attention to solar siting. So, uh, to the extent that this subdivision really has that potential. Uh, and I would suspect uh, if it is uh, potentially marketed that way, there are a lot of people at Scarborough that also uh, have an interest in uh, energy efficient homes uh, with solar panels or at least with good passive solar siting. So um, both in terms of marketing and in terms of conservation, uh, it might be very attractive for potential buyers. So I just ask that you think about how that might work into the development of this site. Great, thank you. Thanks. I think it looks good for preliminary subdivision. Great. Roger? And I, yeah. I would like to try to get this last item in. I don't oh, wanna oh, okay. I don't wanna cut anyone short, but we're we're I think we're right on the, the edge here, so let's all just try right. to keep oh, that in mind. Sure. I think he's um Thanks. basically trying to abide by all the uh, concerns the staff has. I just had one question. I couldn't find what, the connectivity to Mitchell Hill Heights. Can you show me where that is real quickly? It's 
So the town owns property up here, and then I believe that is the open space for Mitchell Hill, okay. or is it the one that's owned by uh, Phil Grondin? I believe it's the one owned by Grondin. Okay. But it's all sort of. So they're, they're they're both they're both to the rear of the site, which is all going to be in the open space. Okay. All right. So there will be a connection. They just won't. Uh, we're not proposing any physical connection like a. Yeah. Okay. Like a, and just to speed along, I, 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 um, I would agree with your idea about uh, in lieu of sidewalks, just widening the road, you know, to accommodate. So I'm all set. Thanks, Roger. Nick. Yeah. yeah, challenging site. Uh, you were out there. Yeah, and, you know, main concerns, of course, are going to be erosion. Um, you know, how you deal with storm water. Whether or not those, I mean, it looks like the letter said the soils are suitable, but 36 inches for everything you wanted to do. Um, yeah, challenging site. I'd, I'd be interested to see how it progresses to the next step here. Um, I'll come back, but I'll wait for one. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, I'm basically on the same wavelength. Um, you've got your challenges, but I appreciate you being responsive to the comments to this point. Um, and you're you know, including your willingness to sort of revise and regrade. Obviously, grading is a challenge throughout. Um, on the sidewalks, you know, I, I generally do uh, lean toward toward uh, requiring that, um, even if it is just a few house lots. Um, I appreciate there are again some grading challenges and some other things. You know, but we'll see where the board ultimately lands. Uh, but um, again, we're just at a preliminary stage right now. Um, you know, perhaps there could be an in lieu payment to the town's fund for creating sidewalks elsewhere in town if, if that's where we end up. Um, so I, you know, I think there there could be some some wiggle room there. Uh, although I do generally do I do generally kind of gravitate toward wanting to require sidewalks. Um, appreciate that you're avoiding wetland impacts and and um, uh, you can keep us posted on the on the archaeological. Uh, outlook that does sound a bit odd given this is a gravel pit that's been heavily excavated. Uh, so hopefully that is just sort of a, an administrative misunderstanding. Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of the other things that can be you know, worked on with staff, again, including regrading and some of the lot alignments and such. But given all that, I think uh, it's accurate to say that the board collectively is okay with this for preliminary subdivision purposes. And uh, we can see where we go from here. Okay, great. Thank Again, you. there's no particular action needed. For oh, that. that was just yeah. about to ask you. Okay. Just to clarify. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Speaking of waiting, item number 15 Wallace Fengler requests a subdivision amendment for Freedom Road, Assessor's Map R9, Lot 6. Jamel? We made it. <laughs> <laughs> We're running our two minute offense here. You got here. two minutes. All right. Yeah. Go. Uh, so, this is located in the RF zoning district along uh, Freedom Road, specifically. The applicant's here tonight for a proposed subdivision amendment. Uh, the applicant was granted an approval for the third subdivision amendment in August 2011, and this would be the fourth uh, subdivision amendment as proposed. Uh, tonight, the applicant is in front of the board requesting to divide a two acre lot uh, to allow for the construction of a new single family home. Access to the lot is proposed via an existing gravel access drive within the existing right of way from Freedom Road to the property. The existing right of way is proposed to be named Mayfield Lane and is proposed to be extended to a total length of 1,000 feet. While the applicant has provided a street design meeting the basic private way standards, any further division of land or additional dwelling units will require board review in, in consideration of the street design and lot layout. Since the pr proposed lot will be at accessed by a driveway, uh, staff recommends that approval of the driveway be required from the fire department prior to uh, issuance of a building permit. That's all I have. Thanks, Jamel. Mm -hmm. I'll turn over to Mr. Frank for a brief uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be very brief. I, I believe that the location map shows uh, the piece of property we're talking about, the Mitchell Hill Heights subdivision, uh, which Mr. Fengler had actually sold as part of uh, the development had retained 54 acres to the back with a, uh, a private right-of-way. Basically, this private right-of-way, if you will, was a gravel access driveway uh, with a paper right-of-way. 
Uh, what we're asking is to sell a two acre piece uh, to Mr. Cody uh, so that he can build a single family house to the back of there. Uh, so really from a, a construction standpoint, the construction is nothing. We're going to actually utilize the existing gravel drive that's there. Uh, Mr. Fengler has walked it with the fire department, or at least driven it with the fire department, uh, and they're comfortable with it. Uh, we have actually designed a private way such that if another house gets knocked off there, well, again, we'll be back to you folks anyway to amend the subdivision one more time, but we actually do have the private way uh, design. So really it's, it's more an amendment to uh, extend the private way basically on paper uh, so that we have funded for the lot as well as retained funded for the remaining land of Mr. Fengler uh, and basically allow us to uh, convey a two-acre lot to, to Mr. Cody. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I conclude my presentation and uh, uh, so we have to answer your questions. Great. Thank you. I'm not going to take anything for granted this time. Is there any public comment <laughs> on this item? Would you like to say something, Boy, Mr. Fengler? Yeah. You waited here. You may as well get your I did have two cents Captain in. Jim Butler from the fire department come down and the road that I have there is more than just a driveway and it's uh, used by dump trucks year round pretty much except for when there's too much snow and he said I just needed to cut a couple branches so I wouldn't scrape his equipment but other than that he was fine with it so that's all I wanted to add thank you I have a couple quick questions I'll go first I'm jumping right in um, so the, 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 the road frontage for that two-acre lot is on that gravel road. Correct, yes. And it's, it's not necessarily to town standards, I'm guessing, but it's to That's the correct. satisfaction of the fire department? Yeah, for the one lot, it's not to what you would call town standards, if you will, yeah. for a private way. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, if there's a second lot, if it does get divided back here, uh, the design is there, and that, that private way will be constructed to the town standards for private way. Okay. As long as the fire department's happy, I don't have a problem with gravel roads. So, um, especially for one lot. So, can you explain to me what else is back there on that road? Is there another house back on there? No, there's not. It's just. Uh, so it's just a, right now that that's a gravel road to a big field. It's woodlands. Woodlands. Okay, woodlands, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. I wish I had the satellite picture. Um, so it's just a gravel road to woodlands, and you're cutting in that. Your your uh, clear cutting or whatever you're. They'll be certainly clearing associated with the house construction here, the septic system, the well, the, the yeah, house, the right stuff. Right, right, basically, but the construction you'll see back there will be limited okay. to the basically like a building permit process yeah, no, associated I, with the one yeah, lot. Yeah, that's fine. So it's one house lot on basically an existing gravel driveway. Correct. That's exactly what it is. Okay. I'm, I'm good with that. All right. Thanks. Rachel? No question. Thank you. Further questions? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think I'm, I'm fine with this as well. And um, without belaboring it, I'll just go ahead and put the motion forward. Move to approve the project titled Fourth Amended Subdivision Plan, Fengler Woodlands, proposed by Wallace Fengler, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics, dated September 17th, 2018, with the following findings and conditions. <coughs> findings as stated. Conditions, number one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, a plan notation that states no further development may occur on map R9, lot six, without review of the private way by the planning board in accordance with town standards, and 1B, the total disturbed area associated with the proposed construction. Number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall receive approval of the driveway from the Scarborough Fire Department. Number three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay a recreation contribution fee in the amount of $250. And number four, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That's the motion. Second. I have a question, though. Okay. So we have a second from, from Roger and I'll, discussion. I'll give, it, I'll give it a third in a minute. I just want to... Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, the, and I think I know the answer, but the um, school impact fee that can be assessed with the building permit, with the building permit, we, we don't mention that on here. <coughs> we haven't always, in the past. What's that? We, we haven't in the past on the motion. It's, yeah. just, it's just a given. Yeah. 
it's part of the building permit process. Been, okay. yeah, it's, yeah, it's not something that's I ever been I had to pay mine, so I just want to make sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah. If not, next time I'm going to come to the planning board and get a permit. Well, you're right, it's part of the new building permit process. You go into the building permit and they hit it, boom, right there. It's on the application. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate your time tonight. Thanks for your patience. That was a record. <laughs> All right. We have a <coughs> staff report. Uh, two few things. Um, the comp plan neighborhood uh, the comp plan process continues. Comprehensive <coughs> plan. Uh, the town's updating their comprehensive plan this year. Um, we're holding a series of neighborhood meetings uh, to uh, present the draft plan and to uh, ask the public for their feedback and comments. So the uh, next neighborhood meeting is tomorrow night, uh, October 10th, at the North Scarborough Grange Hall. I believe it starts at 6 p.m. Might be. Yep. Has the have the comments and uh, been incorporated into the first round draft already? And we're looking at the second draft now, or is this still on the first draft? This is still the first draft. Uh, the Long Range Planning Committee is still. Um, sort of collecting comments from everyone in town. Thank you. <coughs> and uh, we have a Mylar here tonight uh, for the Tucker Brook subdivision. Um, if you guys could uh, sign that plan um, before you leave, that'd be great. That's all I have. Thank you. Can I just add Thank to, you. Um, I just wanted to give you guys an update because I know it's been a pain for everybody in town, but Gorham Road does have a, de a finish line coming on Monday, and I know we've been doing alternating traffic and, and all kinds of snarl over there. So um, we're actually doing two stream crossings, so we need to be out of the stream and out of the road by Monday. So they're frantically scurrying to get that done, and then we'll have a break from construction over there for until next spring anyway. So. All right, so appreciate everyone's patience with the Gorham Road. <laughs> All right. well, holding you personally responsible. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to look beautiful. I, I curse you every time I go down the road. Thanks for the update. Uh, administrative amendments. Uh, one that has been approved since the last meeting is a, uh, at Dunstan Village. Uh, they propose to relocate uh, two dumpsters on the site uh, to different locations, and those were approved administratively. Any correspondence to report? No. All right. Planning board comments. Just quickly uh, thank um, Jamel for facilitating the site walk that we did earlier this evening. Seems like a long time ago now. <coughs> and thanks in advance for helping us possibly with another one coming up. We can uh, figure that out offline. And um, on the comp plan, as Jamel mentioned, Long Range Planning Committee, of which I'm a member, is still reviewing. Uh, the draft and the and the comments on that from various committees and town departments and also reviewed uh, survey responses from people around town um, so that's ongoing and uh, encourage people to continue to participate uh, as much as they can any other comments all right that I move to adjourn Second. All in favor? We're all Thank in you. <laughs> <laughs>